Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Can you hear us in Mexico? Yes, I can. Okay. Is, 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 okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I'm sitting here and minutes walk to Trafalgar Square in the National Gallery and I'm looking at yesterday's issue of, of the Times. The London Times, as I believe they Gusta in the United States. And in the center of this front page is a very large color photograph, purple and red, and it illustrates a sperm being injected in, into an egg. Yesterday morning on Radio 4, BBC Radio 4, Lord Winston, who is a leading uh, fertility expert, was speaking about his beliefs and attitudes. And in the afternoon, uh, there was an article in the London Evening Standard on the work of a Dr. Panosavos, uh, one of the best known doctors in the world. Uh, and hailed as a fertility expert who came to London uh, a week or so ago to give a press conference on his way, on his method of cloning a human being. Uh, this doctor asserts that he is cloning a human being. Uh, the point is, we cannot get away from the subject, the subject of transforming nature, transforming life through human interaction, and which activity could be summed up by the term biotechnology, bioengineering. And the central point which I hope to make is that we in the world of art, in the general world of humanities, need to confront this daily expanding field. And of course, it's a field which is a worldwide phenomenon. Now, I hope you've got the first slides on. <laughs> and slides have, I suggest, to do with the subject of competition uh, and aggression, violence, and defense uh, against that these phenomena. The boulder before the cave. Now, the right slide shows the scene in an art exhibition on in London at this moment in the Gerwood space. And uh, the artist Elizabeth Kreis has created this form which she calls boulder. Now, boulder is usually connected with stones. This, in fact, is a, a, a form created by the gradual application of pieces of tape. So it's a rather fragile boulder. Now, the boulder before the cave used to be the defense in, in earlier period against aggression from the outside. And here we have aggression coming from the left, as it were. But today, boulders of tape or stone are no longer viable since there is no physical defense against nuclear attack, which would vaporize any amount of boulders, however strong or however big. We've gone beyond the point where we can actually defend ourselves. But the boulder, this boulder, can stand in for another area of threat, and that is the threat of asteroids. And if, as we know, a large enough piece of asteroid should hit the Earth, that could be the end of life on Earth. Now, I suggest, and I'm sure there are very many people who would make the same point, that if the so-called advanced countries of the world could devise schemes to prevent asteroids reaching us. That is the most urgent task, perhaps the only urgent task facing humanity. 
uh, we need a technological fix against this threat. And it could be that the rallying around this idea, the, the investment in this proposal to, to get together and create a defense against an asteroid could unite people in a manner that nothing else could. And instead of pouring all these sums into armaments, let us pour it into a genuine issue. Perhaps we could discuss that. Now, aggression, competition, the subject of these slides, has, of course, a great deal to do with our system of capitalism. And what is capitalism? It is you and I. It's me and you. Human beings are competitive, have aggressive drives, and will defend their place in life, would like to have more than they have. Now, what is so clever, diabolically clever, about capitalism is that it has harnessed these human traits and used them as locomotive force creating systems which systematically build up power structures that enslave majority and keep them under. The worst potentials in human beings is fostered by mass advertising in the media, by a multitude of interacting systems. We need the media to inform ourselves. We need to look at it critically, analytically, and ultimately, I believe, we are faced with the task, the challenge to take it over. Could we please have the next slide? Slides. Now, these slides deal with uh, catastrophes. Catastrophes facing the entire world through the environmental pollution going on. And in the last few months, there have been three or four major articles published in magazines like Science and Nature about these catastrophes. And one of these studies dealt with extinction and made the point that in the next 20, 30 years, possibly one million species could be wiped out. An enormous, unbelievable increase in the power of extinction that, that faces us. And for the past two or three years, this is the subject I have talked about more than any other, been more concerned about than any other. Could we then have the, the following slides, please, which are, are posters which go up in the streets of London daily, and they are from the, an evening paper the Evening Standard, the only evening paper we now have. And they have a first edition in the morning, it's around 10 or 11, and in the afternoon, another edition, and they change the posters. So what you have on the left is the poster of the first story that day, dealing with a salmon scandal, based again on a report, a major report in a scientific magazine. And on, on, on the right, you have the later edition, where they include the speech by President Bush with his idea of landing people on the moon and then going on, on, on to Mars. Now, in the past, in the past years, the media has in fact discussed the bad side of Scottish salmon farming. And two years ago, there was a savage attack on the Scottish salmon farming in the form of a BBC TV program. And so this conjunction in one day of stories which also appeared in the national press that morning 
of a major issue of public health and mistreatment of nature and, and animals. And, and the proposal to spend unimaginable sums and efforts to get a couple of people onto Mars, Twentyfield, sums up the, the, the utterly crazy conjunction in, in which we exist and which the media deals, deals with. We, on the one hand, damage and destroy nature and nullify the right of nature to exist and impose our domination on it and at the same time prepare through technological fixes to, to invade and capture and endlessly expand human capacities. And if you go on to the next slide, we have information on the salmon scandal in, in the media. And if you go on the next slide, which should say, is anything safe to eat anymore? And which shows you on the right, President Bush announcing man's trip to Mars. It's this interaction between mania and aggrandizement which gets me down again and again and makes it very, very difficult to, to face up to the ongoing onslaught through the media. The stories running through the world press of repeated horrors and tensions and frustrations, danger, to go on looking at this, taking it in as a kind of professional duty is, is becoming very hard to maintain as, as time goes on. Could we then tonight, which is with the development of cheap flights. Here you have a, a, a firm advertising flights as in two for one person. We are encouraged to fly and expand. And then the next set of slides uh, emphasize this. In Britain especially, we have firms that, that are, are, are working on an absolute cut rate price for ferrying people uh, around Europe and in the world. And, and there's intense competition to cut, cut, cut. And they, they repeatedly, as you can see here, they give away flights for, well, a couple of pounds at times. And, and there have even been advertisements uh, which said that the firm will give you money to fly them. Now, this is very, very serious. Uh, the government, our government, has announced plans to double the volume of aeroplanes that will come in and out of this country, that will fly over this country. A doubling of flights within the next 20 years. But already, there are, we suffer enormously, we in this country and in worldwide, from the overflight. We know that the pollution from planes is even more dangerous, more extreme than from cars. And, and the cheap flights encourage people to fly, of course, and, and stimulate the idea of flying and expanding. Now, this is a, a threat in so many different ways. Let's just look at some of the threats. There is the, the threat to uh, extinction of species. As people travel the world, as millions and millions do this, 
they will tend to find rare species, rare animals, rare plants, and, and they say, oh, we, we want some of those. And, and so extinction is taking place through uh, flights, through mass flights. Then they, they will taste different dishes, exotic animals, and send it to them in different parts. And again, they will say, oh, well, we like that food. Let's bring the across to, to Europe or vice versa to other countries. And again, extinction is fostered by, by flights. We can go on, and, 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 and you can work out all the, the multitude of dangers involved in mass flight, encouraged, obviously, for motives of profit. The Ryan Air, Air Flight Company is making profit, yearly increase in profits, and essentially that's what this game is about. Now, the next slide will show you, the next set of slides will show you opposition to the new runway proposed for Heathrow. And there is a great deal of opposition in this country, certainly, against that development. We've had mass protests against GM foods. And there are constant uh, protests and demonstrations against mobile telephone masks being installed all over the place. And of course, uh, I'm very sympathetic to this development. The next slides uh, are dealing with, with business uh, Advertising, mass advertising in the mass media keeps the mass media going. We wouldn't have these wonderful color, full of color supplements on Saturday and Sunday in this country if there weren't the advertisers to go into it. And on the right, you have capitalism at its explosive extreme with the latest NASA scandal. In, in the system. Now, if we move on to the next couple of slides, we see extracts from the latest Wired magazine, magazine I'm sure many of you will know, this is the current issue, uh, of Wired, and it has this very sensational article listed on the front, The Making of a Human Clone, Seven Days Inside a Maverick em Embryo Lab. Now, this is a very important article, uh, and it, it proves uh, to us that it really is happening. And, and I have no doubt that cloning will take place, cloning of human beings. It's, it's, it's a matter of time. Most people are against it, oppose it. I, I do believe it, it will happen, and it will happen sooner than, than we wish. And we have this doctor here, as I said before, in London, Dr. Zavos, uh, who actually claims to be in the process of doing so. Now, I, I believe that the, the general trend is, 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 is dangerous. And this area will no doubt dominate the century. The last century was dominated by, by physics, and this century is the century of biotechnology. And who knows what other developments arise from that, that approach of making fundamental cuts, fundamental incisions in, into nature. And I suggest that we need to be drawn into this domain. We, it is not a good strategy to wait till there's more evidence of this activity. 
the, the visual arts in the past have been based on the substantiality of nature. Certain basic forms have maintained themselves over millennia. But from now on, everything, everything is up for manipulation. And we cannot envisage in which direction nature, our own included, will be taken. Monstrosities may and most likely will unfold. We have had them already around Dolly the Sheep. We will not be able to penetrate the internal changes that are being planned. We only know that uncertainties will predominate from now onwards. The experimenters themselves do not know which direction to take. And this is the problem facing visual artists. When the unknown is presented to us, how can we, how will we respond? Could we now have the, the next slide, please? And, 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 and then the next, next slide. I suggest that we should go beyond speaking of art and artists and have, would you now put on the next slide and speak of, of the humanities. We are part, we are part of a wider area which, which is the humanities. And we should join with the humanities in, in dealing, first in understanding, and then if necessary, dealing with, with the challenge of, of the field of biotechnology. The, the slide on the left should be uh, the pig. It sums up to me the, the, the excitement, but also the threat and horror of what we are faced. We are cutting into nature, so we are organizing, reorganizing it, and I think this is quite an amazing image which somehow sums up this, this kind of threat, and also the excitement that is involved. There's no doubt that there is excitement in scientific research and in the application of science. Or on the right, uh, I suggest this is again connected with biotechnology. We are getting stories of a tablet which will keep you up for 48 hours. We are getting stories of genetic manipulation to damp down the appetite, to guard against obesity. I mean, endless, and again, of course, capitalism, profit models, right at the center of all the activity. And could we then go to the last slide, which is cosmology. Now, I suggest that the unification of humanity faced with the threat of asteroids could be the salvation of it for us. In other words, there is an element of hope in my largely pessimistic attitude to life. And again, I see hope in cosmology. Never before, never before have people dreamt uh, of the human capacity that we now have in relation to the cosmos, in looking, in projecting, understanding the cosmos. I think this is all to the good. And again, it's a very hopeful field of human endeavor. I suggest that when we face up to what really is our place in the cosmos, which is uh, not even the tip of pin in relation to it out there, we can have a certain reserve in the expansionist, domineering traits that lie within us all and become more subdued, which would be a good basis to face reality. Uh, there is so much that cosmology and our facing up to it can give us and this, again, is something we can pursue together. 
and we should pursue together. Uh, let me add on a, on, a, on a private note. When I uh, was a student, uh, around 1944-45, I became very fascinated by a man called Edward Sakelli, who was a, um, a therapist, a bit of psychologist, who lived and worked in Mexico and published books, which I was very fascinated by. I wrote to Sikeli, uh, saying perhaps I could work with him, and he wrote back saying I could come to Mexico to a kind of commune that he had and work on uh, old uh, codices for my living. Now, I talked to my teacher, David Bomberg, about this, and he said to me, look, you are European. You have to stay here and face up to our condition and not try and escape into another world. So I took his advice. I never managed to get to Mexico. Now, sadly, at this time, again, I didn't manage to get to Mexico, but I'm quite sure in future I will be there and hopefully meet many of you. And I now wish you lots of luck with the rest of this conference. Bye for now. Gustav. Hello. Gustav, our... Um, can you talk a bit louder? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, a little bit louder if you oh, can. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, we're going to take um, some questions from the audience, um, but Isa, who's here, is going to help translate the questions for you. So the um, you can only hear me, you can't hear the audience. So we're, we're going to... So if you can just wait, and we're going to um, ask the audience to present... How, how did it go? Were the slides all right? Yeah, they were great. Good. Yeah, perfect. Everything worked. Thank great. you. Okay. So, should I just hang on? Yeah, just hang uh, on. Right, I'll hang on. Good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, see? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Are, just one minute. Are, are there questions for, for Gustav or comments on his presentation? Hay preguntas, respuestas. Questions and comments. I got in no. half an hour, wasn't it? No, I think she doesn't. Yeah, perfect. Okay. que la gente entienda que la naturaleza de su deseo es, es inacabable. Hello. Yes, you heard that, Gustav. Hello, it's me. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, well, they're asking here uh, that you talk about. If you could talk a little bit louder. If you come a bit closer to the telephone. Uh, because yes. todo viene del deseo. Todo, toda la ambición y el deseo viene por, eh, por esta ruta. ¿Cuál, ¿Cuál sería la perspectiva de Gustav acerca de hacer comprender que la natura, a la gente que la naturaleza del deseo es inacabable? Ok. Uh, if everything... Gustav, you hear me? Yes. Ok. Uh, more or less, I'm, I'm trying to translate here. Uh, that if everything, uh, after your talk, if you, we could think that everything comes from desire, uh, where should, um, where should this, what, where should this lead to? How do you go from there? Es que, si me las pasan por escrito, me las iban a pasar por escrito. No, I think the, the, I think the question re was related to what is your desire or your mission um, in, in relationship to these questions. Yes. Okay. 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 Can you answer yes. that? Should I answer that? Yes, please. Well, I think fundamentally uh, throughout my sort of conscious uh, adult, semi-adult 
that exists is the desire for change, for changing things the, from the way they are to something else. And that is how I began my uh, if like intellectual life at the age of 16, 17, 18, during the war, in, in, in the last war, and no doubt the war itself, and my experience in Nazi Germany as a Polish, young Polish Jew, uh, is at the base of it. Uh, and, and this feeling, this desire, this challenge has maintained itself to the present day. I, I do feel I need to look at the world and especially the, the dangers and the horrors of the world and make some kind of response either as a speaker or as a reflector or as an artist. And that has been the case for decades and looks as if it will continue into the future. Okay. Another question. Eddie, come on. Uh, Tobias, yo lo que quería antes que nada era agradecer a Gustav su generosidad, su disponibilidad. Uh -huh. Después, perdón, a la gente que haga, vaya a usar el micrófono, por favor, haga las preguntas en inglés. Los que vayan a hablar, eh, preguntar en español, hay que escribir las preguntas. Okay. Uh, first of all, what I wanted to say, I would like to thank Gustav for his generosity to share with us uh, his experience. We would like to have him here, but we do understand that uh, British authorities didn't allow him to be here. And we thank him his disposition to share with us this part of resistance that we are, let's say, the witnesses. And I think for me, it's enough today. And maybe if uh, those who are interested to follow this discussion with him can send their question to SITAC or to PAC in mail, in internet, maybe we can follow this. But today, Gustav had done very uh, enough, and we thank him. I think it's enough for him today. Can I just say something? Hello? See, si, yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Uh, can I just make a clarification? Uh, the, there's no question of being uh, held back to attend. What has happened was that I have a, a travel document which uh, expired uh, at the beginning of last year, which I didn't renew. Uh, and when I sent it in for renewal, uh, it, there wasn't quite enough time, there hasn't been quite enough time for it to be processed. So it's simply a, a document being processed, yes, that is held me back from traveling, but not any kind of authority. I just want to, to clarify clarify that point to, to your audience. Yes? Has that happened? Hello? Sorry. Um, would you like to take more questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Can somebody talk about the issues of biotechnology, which is the center? <laughs> and I'd happily go on talking about that. ¿Alguien tiene preguntas en ese sentido sobre el tema de la biotecnología y la relación con el arte? ¿Nadie? A ver si... Aquí, en la naranja. Aquí. Okay, the, the question's being write, uh, written down, uh, Gustavo, so just wait one minute. Uh, in the meantime, let me make a couple of points. Okay. Yes? Yes, please. What I haven't actually raised in my talk was the, the term ethics. Mm -hmm. And let me just say a few words on that, because that is at the center of this approach towards biotechnology. Now, in biotechnology, you have to 
face up to ethical issues. I have in front of me, for example, a publication from the Nuffield, Nuffield Council on Bioethics. Bioethics is at the center of uh, dealing with biotechnology, or at least it should be. And, and so if artists, if the art community and the humanities in general face up to biotechnology, then ethics will be a central form of facing up, up to this. And I find this very admirable and, and necessary. We have developed art in an unethical manner, you might say. We have, to, we have allowed a free fall, and a free for all, especially in the past 20 years or so. And it, I believe it's time, it's high time that we pull back this direction and brought ethics into art. And one of the reasons, one of the basic reasons why I'm so concerned that we should trace up to biotechnology, that it will force art, it will force the art community and the humanity community to face up to the ethical issues in biotechnology and indirectly to the ethical aspects of art life in, in general. That is at the center of my approach. Gustav, we, I have a question in this sense related to what you just said. Uh, it is, what are your uh, concrete activities to resist this genetic manipulation? And uh, like, like human clonation, uh, what would you be, artistically speaking, your concrete uh, proposal? Yes, well, the, the, the first thing is, is, is facing up to it. In other words, reading, listening, because the volume, I don't know about Mexico, but the volume in England, in Britain, on the subject is overwhelming. You cannot have a single day where the issue isn't put in front of your, your, your face. And I don't watch television, but it must be quite strong on television. So the first thing is to look, read, study, analyze. That is the basis of all the systems in our society. Our society is now so complex, so interactive, that uh, it's only through a, a vast amount of information that is presented, uh, that is potential, not, not even speaking of the internet, and that is the first task to inform ourselves. Uh, and this is quite a difficult task, and it t takes a long time, but it's, it's extremely interesting and, and ultimately rewarding. Uh, and on the basis of information, on the basis of knowledge, we can then consider taking steps. Uh, as far as I'm personally involved, I'm not physically interacting with the issue, except, uh, as I said, uh, taking it in and occasionally giving talks su such as this, where I try and, and, and present points of view. But uh, in, in the long term, if enough people understand uh, and are concerned, then it can lead to action. I think it should lead to action. I certainly uh, support any movement against genetic modified planting, and we are now faced with the likelihood of that happening in, in this country in the near future. Okay, um, Gustav, there's a question here about uh, a, an exhibition by an artist named Inigo Manglano Ovalle, who did a piece that involved creating a sperm bank uh, that was exhibited within a museum here in Mexico. And there, uh, the question is asking, what do you feel is the artist's responsibility or how do you feel about this piece? You know, ultimately, you know, uh, like putting a sperm bank within the context of, of, of an art museum. Now, I'm, I'm glad this question came up because it is extremely critical. What my position has been all for decades that any artist using technology and science needs to face up to the risks and dangers involved in both technology and science mm -hmm. and, and, and needs to be prepared to oppose directions which are dangerous. And so this is an excellent question, comes right to the point. 
I believe that an artist who makes a work that involves biotechnology and simply exhibits it without having analyzed and gone through this point of criticizing, crit critiquing, is, is in danger of making a terrible mistake and misleading both the art and, and world and, and, and the public. Now, this is basic. It's very difficult. There is, for example, uh, the most famous example of tech biotech art is that uh, proposal by the Australian artist Stellark, who uh, has produced a vast body of work, and he now is planning to grow the, a human ear on his arm, one of his arms. Now, that has been uh, uh, widely publicized. I don't know how far he has got. It's based on the growing of a human ear on a rat, which is a famous case a few years ago. Now, to my knowledge, Stellark has never taken any critical attitude towards biotechnology or, or to technology as such. And so I'm very, very suspicious of the direction that he's taking. Okay. Um, we're going to take a question in, in English directly to you. Uh, there's a question in English coming directly to you, Gustav. Mr. Metzger, um, yeah. I, I really wanted to ask you some something in relation to the question of ethics, and it, and it is that, in a certain way, there is no um, art addresses these questions always with a mixture of ambiguity and horror, and of fascination and horror. And I was somehow thinking that it's impossible to imagine that art wouldn't work in this in this way. In, and that triggered to my memory somehow the feeling I have of the people that were around you in, in the 60s and the destruction of in art symposium, symposium. Because in that moment, the question of, the, of nuclear war was very much at hand. Okay, yeah. And people like Faustel or Stockhausen precisely embodied that ambiguity. They were at the same time horrified by the possibility of mass destruction, but immensely attract to the imagery, the power, and the lot. So somehow, I would like you to, to would like to ask you if you really think you can differentiate those, those two elements. And aside to that, in relation to that, to that issue, what do you think of Stockhausen's fascination with the destruction of the Twin Towers? Because in a certain way, I feel that his position was logical, that it had to do with that aesthetics that he and Faustel, for instance, were, were interested. And somehow, I feel that that is the problem of, 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 the, of the natural relationship of art with these questions, that it's impossible to separate those two elements. Thank you. Well, this, uh, it's a very, a very profound uh, presentation of a fundamental issue that is, that is essential to, to art, the art of our time, to all the arts, to, to, to music, uh, poetry, literature, philosophy. And there is no simple answer, of course, but certainly I, I respect the, the formulation that you've just made, and, and it couldn't, I think, be, be bettered. And so I, I, I won't add to, 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 to the way you've presented it. As to a, a response, I think the challenge to art and artists is to face the unknown, to face the difficult, and, and, and to take it in, even however painful that reality may be, and, and then hopefully to make some kind, kind of response. And that's our duty, uh, and, and many of us do that. I've tried to do that. Now, as regards to Stockhausen and, and the, uh, his speech, his statement, which I've read in the original, German, I've got it somewhere at, at, in my place. Uh, that is an important statement. And what I, what I, how I responded to that event, it's all I can say. 
how I responded was to feel that this act, this act was so evil, so so extreme, and and in as far as it had been planned for years, evidently it had been perfected like like a, a valuable watch, and in that extent, the human beings who created this work in the way, say, that Stockhausen responded to it, were so evil, were so manipulative, that there is no way for an artist to respond to that. It has, as it were, to be excised in a way that I believe, I believe the Nazi concentration camps have to be excised because you cannot make an adequate artistic, aesthetic, or, or philosophical or religious response to it. When evil becomes that ex- to that extremity as the people who conducted that uh, event in New York uh, and, uh, and Washington and planned elsewhere, they have to be excised from the memory of mankind. And at that extreme point, there is no need for artists or philosophers to respond. There is no capacity for art to respond. And my main point is this, and there, that may create a big discussion. There should be no response. And in that sense, I uh, distance myself from Stockhausen, from the fact that he responded so immediately, the words that he used, the position he took up, I feel he made a very, very profound mistake in the way he conducted himself at that point in history. Wow. (laughs) Wow, Gustav. Look, I am very happy to tell you that I am here on the table with a lot of questions, very interesting questions from many people in the audience. I know that it was very important for you to come here and that you were eager to, to talk with everybody and discuss this in person with all of these people. You would be amazed how many people we have here. So I'm, I am very sorry that we're running a little short of time and I think it gets very complicated. But what I can uh, commit to do, and you tell me what you think, is that I will... Um, Join all the questions that everybody has. I will ask people now in the audience to please write down questions you have the whole day. Leave them at the registration table outside of the theater. And uh, they will be translated. And I will mail them to you because I know, uh, and and people should know that uh, Gustav Metzger cannot be reached either by fax or by mail or by phone. So (laughs) you can only reach him by mail. And I will mail them to you and and maybe we can take it from there, okay? Sure. And thanks very much for your patience and thank the organizers and the audience. Thank you, Gustav. Yes. Um, I'm glad to have you even in this way. I mean, it's an honor for us to have you with us and here. Good luck for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Gustav. Bye for now. Bye. Pues eso. Que, que, que las estas. Sí. Sí. All right. Uh, we're going to quickly move on to Antonio Mutadas, his presentation. I'd like to briefly introduce him. Um, Mutadas was born in Spain and has lived in New York since 1971. His works allude to themes related to society, politics, communication, and the relationship between public and private space within social structures. His works additionally present research on channels of information and ways that these channels may be used to censor information and spread ideas. Recent works by Muntadas have addressed complex issues related to cultural translation. And his, he works in various media and on different surfaces, including photography, video, publications, the internet, and multimedia uh, installations. Some recent exhibition or some exhibitions that he noted that are relevant to the presentation he's doing today are Haute Couture or uh, High Culture and from 1983, which addressed culture the um, the relationship between cultural spaces in museums and shopping malls, the boardroom from 1987, uh, which was uh, addressed re- um, representations of power. And the file room from 1994, which was um, an 
an archive on uh, on, on cu the culture of, of censoring images, uh, and also um, he wanted to mention again a little bit of his projects on cultural translation, creating exhibitions that would then travel from one institution or one context to another, and and would evolve within those spaces. We'll, we'll start with Antonio Mutaz. His title, uh, the title of his uh, talk today is Business as Usual, The World is on Sale, Political and Marketing Strategies and Cultural Consequences. Thanks. Thank Bueno, es difícil eh, empezar después de la presentación de un filósofo visual como eh, John Metzer. Creo que ha sido una conexión intensa y que casi yo hubiese sugerido haber dejado unos minutos de silencio después. Bien, empezaré por lo que todo el mundo empieza, son los agradecimientos. Eh, creo que la gente del PAC hace un gran esfuerzo con CITAC y que hay una cantidad de gente que está envuelta que hay que realmente... Creo que en pocas situaciones en el globo se encuentran situaciones como esta, que durante cada año gente se encuentra y llega a, a discutir de situaciones que a todos nos preocupa. El uh, texto que estas notas que voy a hacer, que casi diría que es una presentación ecológica, va a ser bastante breve, en el sentido de que en estas situaciones hay unos usos de las palabras que a veces son, uh, bueno, uh, a veces necesarias, pero a veces quizás se convierten en, en una situación que, por decirlo de alguna manera, querría decir, de cierta polución. Entonces, la palabra ecológica me viene como metáfora. Me parece que CITAC es un foro apropiado para discusión, para planteamientos e interrogaciones dentro de los sistemas culturales definidos por un contexto del sistema del arte, sus vocabularios y sus interpretaciones. Me propuse el aprovechar la invitación para cuestionarme cosas que siento están ahí, las vemos, pero quizás a veces no queremos afrontarlas. Es un ver, o sea, referirme al ver que no necesariamente es percibir. En el fondo son unas notas que es pensar en, en voz alta. Si estas notas van a ser leídas, algunas en español, algunas en inglés, porque las he ido haciendo. Es una especie de mosaico de preguntas. Yo diría que en absoluto son respuestas. Son uh, una serie de... Yo creo que el arte y los artistas uh, difícilmente podemos contribuir con respuestas. Son interrogaciones. Diré que todos mis planteamientos están en relación al desarrollo de mi actividad como artista y aún así la decisión personal, de una, aún así, es una decisión personal no hablar directamente de mi trabajo, es decir, de la formalización de proyectos realizados, en parte por el gap que representa el explicar un trabajo con la considerable pérdida de percepción e incluso información en relación al documento y, por supuesto, a limitaciones de tiempo. También tendré que decir que he tenido posibilidades en México de presentar mi trabajo. Entonces, me tomo una situación en que voy a presentar unas imágenes. El título de esta presentación, que es mi contribución, es Business as Usual. Es básicamente un collage contaminado de imágenes, algunas frívolas, algunas imágenes, la mayoría de más mí y algunas hechas por mí, pero que están ordenadas y que creo que habla por sí solo. He decidido situarlo entre dos narraciones, esta introducción y otra después, y como introducción me referiré a los parámetros que creo determinan la realidad que nos ha tocado vivir. Parafraseando el libro de Jane Nesbitt, La paradoja global, me referiré a dos parámetros, la cultura de la paradoja y la economía como causa-efecto. 
La paradoja como imagen construida que define nuestra contemporaneidad, el sí pero no, o el no pero sí, y lo global como estrategia multicultural que ha devenido una realidad económica. Vivimos en un circo económico donde la mayoría de valores ha perdido sentido y está en venta. La falacia de que controlamos nuestras vidas, el paradigma del voto, la mayoría de decisiones, todo se basa finalmente en sistemas comerciales. Escoja el sexo de su hijo o el diamante apropiado para usted, claro, por un costo o un pago de cuota intermediario. En el fondo, todo viene dado por parámetros comerciales o intereses económicos. En ello, la vida está en juego. Un trasplante de órgano o un pretrasplante genético es solo cosa de tiempo y de dinero. Business as usual, the world is on sale. Marketing strategies and political and cultural consequences. The rise and race of economics in a liberal global world under the disappearance of ideologies and values create a series of chains of cause effects and from the cultural perspective where everything is on sale. Economics affects politics, ethics and aesthetics. Countries are for sale and war is the evidence. The media then, the ultimate law, cost television production and views guarantee, the war. The states are for sale, the Arnold Hollywood effect. Cities are for sale, using city planning, tourism and cultural strategy of the society of the spectacle, where cultural Olympics, forums and capitals of Europe is the device. Institutions are for sale, founding sponsorship and dictatorship of the audience rates, affect programs, values and criteria. Paid exhibition as a model for all range of institutions, from the Guggenheim to PS1, from corporate to official national shows. The chains continue to the final knot of the chain, the artist, as an independent producer with his or her paradox and contradictions. The artista como participe y protagonista. Las imágenes que vamos a ver, si puedes ir lanzándolas, a modo de collage, repito, forman parte de este paisaje mediático y consumista.
Si sí, como decía al principio, estas imágenes se plantean como un collage y la definición de un territorio en que todo está en venta y que la economía lo mueve todo, si hacemos un zoom en relación al entorno cultural, finalmente el contexto propuesto por SITAC y su resistencia si aceptemos con cierta ingenuidad la paradoja de residuos de posicionamientos utópicos y de cierto optimismo constructivo. Revisemos el rol del artista desde una perspectiva teórica y práctica, y práctica parafraseando a Ramón Perramón en la introducción a un ciclo de discusiones en torno a prácticas artísticas en la huella de Sevilla. El legado de la tradición nos aporta conceptos como la novedad, la sofisticación, el discurso endogámico, la figura del artista como un ser visionario críptico con escasa capacidad de hacer partícipe de su discurso a segmentos más amplios de la sociedad, raro, extravagante, formalmente hábil, con afán de protagonismo, seductor, etc. La mayor parte de las instituciones, centros de arte, museos, concursos, galerías, contribuyen a la consideración del arte en términos de espectáculo cultural, a menudo permitiendo que la vigencia de esta visión tradicional se perpetúe y frenen otras nuevas experiencias que se están posicionando. Creo que los que forman parte de la institución arte en cualquiera de sus vertientes nos hemos de imbricar en aspectos, contenidos y realidades que tienen puntos de mira desde otras perspectivas disciplinarias, ajenas al discurso artístico, educadores, antropólogos, urbanistas, activistas, sociólogos, prácticas creativas impulsadas por personas que mantenemos un vínculo con el mundo del arte y que trabajamos con aspectos de la realidad sociopolítica que por su envergadura y complejidad requieren un replanteamiento de la figura del artista, entendiendo que la terminología que hasta ahora se daba a esta figura queda extinguida o inoperante. 
resistencia a qué, a la integración, para algunos ya demasiado tarde, después de tantos años de buscarla, finalmente el artista con posicionamiento de la sociedad. Más preguntas aparecen. El activismo se queda corto, es parte de un discurso maximalista, ingenuo, sin posibilidades de intervención o resultados limitados. Todo se recupera. Tenemos que conformarnos al ámbito cultural o incluso al ámbito artístico donde las discusiones, diálogos, peripecias y malabarismo tienen sentido protegido de un contexto específico. ¿Cómo, producir, cómo puede producirse la permeabilidad de lo protegido y lo público? ¿De qué forma levantar la voz y crear imágenes de resistencia tiene sentido en este momento? ¿La resistencia a qué, a quién, dónde y cómo? ¿Es la acción la única arma real donde puede producir desequilibrio, tensión y realmente cuestionar las cosas? ¿No hay posibilidad fuera de una actividad de acción? ¿Es la violencia la única forma? ¿Es el terrorismo, palabra reposicionar, la única acción posible? ¿Quién define al terrorista? ¿El diccionario? Google Search, el gobierno americano. ¿Cuáles son los parámetros de interrogación y traducción de palabras y conceptos tales como intervención, activismo, resistencia, desestabilización, disidencia, terrorismo? Resumiendo, ¿cuál era el rol del artista si lo reivindicamos desde posiciones de vanguardia? La vanguardia acabó, dirán la mayoría. Quizás cambio de salón y de territorio si es que todos los discursos son asumidos. Es que los artistas con la intención y voluntad de transgredir y contribuir a cambios sociales, políticos y culturales ya no son suficientes la creación de discurso a través de imágenes, textos, en una sociedad de consumo que todo está establecido que la acción debe pasar por otros parámetros. La política, totalmente desprestigiada, es como pasar de un sistema a otro, el del arte por el de la política. La racionalidad y la lógica como paradigmas establecidos y aceptados, ¿Es la lucha armada una estrategia sumida que ha dejado de tener los aspectos revolucionarios, inventivos y creativos a una relación ética-estética? A la vista de todo ello no nos queda otra opción que el caso por caso, proyecto por proyecto y situación por situación. Las posiciones generalizadas y las consignas de partido y directrices de tendencias están en contra de un análisis pormenizado donde la opinión individual se mantenga. Las espadas están en alto, las estrategias abiertas. En mayo del 68 decíamos la imaginación al poder. Bien, ¿y ahora qué haremos con el poder? Ahí se queda. ¿Quieres quedar aquí? Porque me lleva. Thank you, Mutadas. We're going to move quickly on to Thomas Hirshhorn, uh, so we have time for, for discussion afterwards. Um, Thomas Hirshhorn was born in Switzerland and has lived in Paris since 1984. In 2000, he received the prestigious Prix Marcel Duchamp in France. He has exhibited his work in numerous art centers, museums, and galleries all over the world. He has been presented at the Venice Biennale, the Lyon Bi um, Biennale, and the Document 11. Hirshhorn's work often takes the form of altars and kiosks. We saw some of his work yesterday, uh, which he dedicates to writers and artists. Uh, today, Hirshhorn will discuss his project, Batai Monument, which was created in 2002 for Document 11 in Kassel, Germany. Uh, Thomas. Buenos días, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank uh, first uh, Isa Benitez uh, for inviting me to come to Mexico. And I would like to thank the CITAC team who takes nicely care of us. Now I will speak about a work I made, the Batay Monument. I made it in 2002 for Document 11. I will show you a video report about this work. I will comment it. The video will be about 40 minutes. Please, can you turn down the lights?
Preparation. From my experience with projects in public spaces, so far I have worked on 44 projects, both large and small. I know that the pre preparation phase is extraordinarily important. For this project, two aspects has to be prepared at the same time. On the one hand was preparation on the ground in Kassel, which encompassed the selection of a site for the project, looking for potential partners, on-site organizations, and generally getting to know the city of Kassel. On the other hand was preparation in Paris, including the substantive discussion on Georges Bataille. I tried to use the time available as extensively as possible. Together with Oqui Envisor, I set the basic futures of the project early on. It would be a project in public space, a monument, as part of the monument series. That is why, even before I visited Castle for the first time, I had already decided in November 2000 that I wanted to make the Bataille Monument. The Bataille Monument is the third in a series of four monuments. I realized the Spinoza Monument in Amsterdam in 1999 and the Deleuze Monument in Avignon in 2000. And I want to make in the future the fourth and last monument in the series for Antonio Gramsci. The most important thing in selecting a location in Kassel was the potential helpers, the residents, the supporting contact people. And insofar, getting to know Lothar Kannenberg, the, the independent initiator of the Philippinenhof boxing camp was of prime importance. After visiting and talking with him and the young people he boxes with on several occasions, I was certain that the Philippinenhof boxing camp and the charismatic and exemplary position of Lothar Kannenberg had to be an important fixed point for the choice of a site for my project. It was up to me to convince him and the youngsters of the seriousness of my project. I succeeded in doing that for one thing because I admire him for the fight that he is fighting with himself. The dynamics of the boxing camp was therefore a very important factor in selecting a site and getting to know Lothar Kannenberg was decisive for the project. The preparation in Paris and in France, including working with Christophe Fiat, a poet who explained the work of Georges Bataille to me from his own personal slant and in context was an enrichment for me. In dialogue with Christophe, I explored the work of Georges Bataille. He explained Georges Bataille to me. I encouraged him to map out Bataille's work for me visually. Together with Christophe, I made four trips to stations in Georges Bataille's life. The four trips were to Saint-Germain-en-Laye, Wesley, Lacoste, the castle of the Marquis de Sade, and the caves of Lascaux. As short as they were, these trips were an important step toward understanding the work of Georges Bataille, as well as demanding to deal with it freely. Christoph Fiat always made succinct, precise statement that helped me understand the context in the life and work of Georges Bataille. The Bataille Monument is dedicated to the French writer Georges Bataille, 1897 to 1962. I take the responsibility for this choice. It is a form of art artistic engagement. I am a fan of Georges Bataille, and once a rule, he is at once a rule model and a pretext. Bataille explored and developed the princess of loss, of overexertion, of the gift, and of excess. I admire him for his book, La Parmodite, and his text, La Notion de Dépense. Choosing Bataille means opening up a broad and complex force field between economy, politics, literature, art, erotica, and archaeology. There is a great deal of explosive pictural and textual material. Bataille has nothing to do with Castle. The Bataille Monument is not a contextual artwork. Rather, the monument could as easily be shown in another neighborhood, in another city, in another country, or another continent. The Bataille Monument wanted friendship and sociability. The Bataille Monument wanted knowledge and information. The Bataille Monument wanted making links and creating connections. And the Bataille Monument wanted including people and be confronted to a non-exclusive audience. The monument was projected to be split in eight elements, a shuttle service, a library, an exhibition, a snack bar, a TV studio, different workshops, four web cameras, and a sculpture. I was looking for a site that assumes the reality that the construction and maintenance can be achieved, that friction and engagement are possible. 
I was looking for a site that it itself a piece of reality. I wanted to make, make it right where people live, in a housing complex. I wanted to do it with the residents, especially because of what I learned from the other monuments I made. I wanted to supervise and follow the project myself for the whole duration of the exhibition. I also wanted to be there when it was dismantled. Without illusions, without phantasmas, I wanted to act. I wanted to act with and through art. Hope not as a dream or escape. Hope as discussion and confrontation. And hope as the principle of taking action. All in all, I made 10 trips to Castle in the period from November 2000 to April 2002. I knew I wanted to devote as much as personal energy as possible to this project. That is, for example, to travel there without assistance from my studio. That is in any case difficult, since different laws prevail in public space than in a museum or in a gallery. So, for example, it is important to speak the language spoken on the spot. As I say, before the side question is, is for me extremely important, and that precisely because it's so decisive, I can only be, it can only be resolved instinctively in a kind of emergency situation. This is because although I spent all in all more than two months in Kassel, I did really not know the city. So I needed every information from residents or Kintonsons, information material from the city, and of course by visiting the site. Construction. It took two months to set up the Batai Monument. There were between 20 and 30 young people and other residents of the housing complex working on it. My project was to seek no experts, technician, art students, or other art connoisseurs to help build it. Instead, I wanted to build my project together with the residents. It was no problem to find young people and other residents wanting to work on the project. The incentive was the eight euro that was paid and a holy wage. I will come back to the problem regarding payment later. For, you, for me, one thing that was certain was that everyone would be paid for her, his or her work. I hate volunteerism for the sake of art. I refuse to appeal to volunteers, that is, unpaid workers, in order to implement my work of art. So that extends, the workers were never materials. Instead, I could not compl complete my project on my own. It was too big. And that is why I posted the question and demand, don't do it my way, let's do it together. Construction, the Batai Monument, was the hardest project I ever created. I went behind my limits. I was burned out. I really had to activate strengths that I did not have. The construction was greatly overtaxing in terms, terms of technical efforts, organization, group dynamics. I, it was one big mess up. The group that came together was very diverse with respect to age, cultural and social background, attitude toward works. But I did not want to exclude anyone, no one and never. I said, if you live here, you can work on the project. When, despite all these problems and progress we made in through the first week, I went home. I had moved into an apartment in the housing complex to discover that my apartment has been broken into and my personal hi-fi, laptop, photography and video equipment has been stolen. I did knew that it was one of us and I did knew that the continuation of the project was thus uncertain. I had serious doubts about me and my project. I knew that I would have to provoke a solution since this was a test of my project's contact with reality. In other words, was my project too out of touch with reality? I also had to take responsibility for what happened. It didn't have, I didn't have any choice. Either this was a test that my project would pass or it would be the end of it. I could pass the test only if I got back all the stolen materials without having to look for the thief or the thieves and without calling the police, of course. I was in touch definitely with reality. I get pushed in an emergency situation in order to make the right decision. I was confronted with the fundamental question, what do you want? Where is your position? I could not answer this question hypothetically. I had to be active and I had to use a certain degree of force. I had to counter theory with practice. And I had to convince the neighborhood once again from my engagement. 
The project did pass this test because I was focused only on my art project. People understood it and all stolen material was given back. From this point on, I did knew that my project was perhaps difficult and complex, but I did know as well it was not completely out of touch with reality. This experience and the happy outcome of this test strengthened me in my goal of no wanting to exclude anyone from my working on the project. I thought if art is not capable by, of resisting this more normative pressure of the exclusion, then nothing and no one will be able to. Despite the excellent starting conditions, and by that I mean the relationship to the Documenta 11 team, I was not able to avoid all conflicts. Not that I am afraid of conflicts or conflicts or that I try to avoid it, but one thing that I can say certainly occurred and which is not a new unknown phenomenon for me is what I call the satellite formation, a negative experience that I have made more than once, which I also could not prevent on this project is that of isolating myself, isolating my project, of cutting myself off of the group exhibition project. On the one hand, there were objective reasons for this, satellite formations, the geographical distance between my project and the main venue of the exhibition Documenta 11, and the increasing stress as opening date approached, and the growing clear-cut hierarchy that were forming, which had a negative effect as regards technical help since our project were future away. The opening. The opening of the Bataille Monument, like the rest of the Documenta 11 opening, took place over the course of three days. I decided that we could celebrate is as well in the housing complex for three days. Every day, there were free drinks and food at the snack bar starting at 6 p.m. I wanted to thank the residents of the Friedrich Wöhler housing complex who accepted the project in spite of the noise and the space we used. On the other hand, I wanted to have our own opening celebration here in the housing complex. This went well, although the cabin family who ran the snack bar was totally overrun by the storms of kids. Most importantly, the opening celebration is the con in the complex server to create a first and mixed audience. But I must admit that I organized this deliberately. I had assumed that the visitor who came to the opening of the Documenta 11 would not correspond to the regular Documenta 11 visitor. So that on these three days, the invitation to the locals encouraged the directed mixing of residents and Documenta 11 vi opening visitors. Also, it definitely took a lot of time to visit the Patai Monument in time, uh, and the program schedule was very full. I noticed the seriousness and genuine curiosity of many opening visitors. Was that the Documenta Mythos? The question to me was, am I capable of making contact with people? Am I capable of creating events? Right on opening day, I realized, realized that earlier, during planning, preparation and setup, I had never thought the Batai Monument could be discussed and criticized as a social art project. I think it is totally proper if social issues are raised through an art project. It is the question as the surrounding, the environment, the reality, the world in its broadest sense. That is a goal of my work. I'm not afraid or false interpretation, misunderstandings, or, or over-interpretations. But one thing has always been clear for me. I am an artist and I'm not a social worker. My project is an art project that aims to assert its autonomy as an art project. This was the starting point and the cornerstone of all discussions I had with the people working on the project as well as with the visitors. Precisely because the Bertai Monument is an art project, it is not possible to exclude anyone from working on it. The guideline was, as the artist, I'm not asking, can I help you? What can I do for you? Instead, as the artist, I'm asking, can you and do you want to help me? complete my project. I wanted to make it clear to the residents of the Friedrich Wöhler Siedlung with discussions, with meetings, with my presence, but as well through the work made together, why I wanted to create my work of art right there with them. Shuttle service. 
I wanted the shuttle service to be an element of the Batai monument and not a separate service. The shuttle service was to create a link to go from the housing complex to the Brinding Brewery and vice versa. I posted a quotation by David Hammonds on the freestanding panels set up at the two shuttle stops in the Friedrich Wöhler housing complex and in front of the entrance to the Binding Brewery. The quote is, the art audience is the worst audience in the world. It's overeducated, it's conservative, it's out to criticize, not to understand, and it never has any fun. Why should I spend my time playing to that audience? That's like going into a lion's den. So I refuse to deal with that audience, and I play with the street audience. That, any, that audience is much more human, and their opinion is from the heart. They don't have any reason to play games. There's nothing gained or lost. This quote is both problematic and contradictory, but it strikes the score the core of the complexity of work in public space and the audience of public space. David Hammonds is part of the art world and his work is part of the art market. Nonetheless, this sentence also defiant a certain autonomy of a work of art. I wanted to pro propose it as an appeal for reflection and as well as a physical link between the two stops of the shuttle service. What I see in this quote that applies entirely for the Batai Monument project is that it also has nothing to win or loss. Work in public space is never a total success, but it's never a total failure. Instead, it is about an experience, about exposing oneself, about enduring and working out an experience. The shuttle service was intended as a space to exchange and the mean of regula regulation the flow of visitors. I did not want to, visitors to come to the Batai monument by the bus load or in tourist vans. Either there were no documenta guides in, at the Batai monument. I wanted the visitor come by themselves. A maximum of four people fit in our two Mercedes. I thought it would facilitate conversation and I, it would protect the housing complex from two large groups. In fact, I think it is only possible to confront art as on an individual basis. Groups of art tourists could of course not be totally avoided, but at least it was left up to the initiative of the respective groups and nothing was done to encourage them. The library, the George Bataille Library was intended to facilitate connections based on the work of George Bataille. For, he, for these reasons, there were no books in the library by or about George Bataille. Instead, there were books on five subjects, word, image, art, sports, and sex. These thematics on the work of Bataille were supposed to expand and develop. Uwe Fleckner, an art historian from Berlin, who proposed these categories and selected most of the books and cassettes, put together the list of books in an extremely precise and subjective manner. I am pleased that he insisted on the selection, uncompromisingly and without trying to curry favor with anyone. However, I must admit that at first I was surprised at the relatively small number of books. There were a total of 700 books, books and cassettes. I think I was surprised because we had set up too many book stands and when the books were, were all placed on the shelves, it looks rather empty. This was difficult to stand out in the beginning, but it was good to have the resi resisted the urge to want to fill the shelves. Also, I had underestimated the list of books compiled by Uwe Fleckner, and I'm happy that we did not only post it, but we also light out photocopies of the list. Very many visitors took a, with them a copy. I do not regard that as positive itself, because it could also have to do with the consumer urge to want to take something with you. But the book list is not only form, it is also program and can make sense even separate from the library. The library space with chairs, sofas and armchairs was a room and a meeting place for the young people from the housing complex. In a realistic and very modest appraisal, the library led in some cases to residents of the complex, complex borrowing books. I recall Elfriede who borrowed and read all the books by Marquis de Sade not having previously known this author. 
The greatest demand was for the video porno cassettes. What impressed me regarding the pornographic video was that no one said anything moralizing about them to me. Aside from the initial discussions about the overboard success of these videos and the fact that it could not be quarantined that no people under 18 would also watch them, the subject of sex in the library seemed to regulate itself. Insofar as without, within a few days, all that was left in the library uh, was the pornographic video where the empty cases. The library was a space where visitors and residents meet. I noted that it was important that this space belongs to the young people since they live there, but as well to the visitors. The exhibition. The aim of the Bataille exhibition was to convey information and knowledge about the life and the work of George Bataille. For four, four parts of the exhibition were devoted to this goal. The topography in the center of the room showed two superimposed maps, the diagram of Georges Bataille's work and the relief map of the city of Kassel. The books of Georges Bataille were placed there to represent the buildings. That is, the work were the structures. With four integrated videos and the video on the Papuans, I wanted to depict the movement, the dynamic forces in the life of Georges Bataille, as well as what I considered his incredibly topical relevance. Especially after initial misunderstanding about the use and purpose of the video, video equipment, this ultimately worked well, which I feel is very important since there is nothing more trying than non-functional video in exhibitions. I'm pleased that we managed to keep them going in the Friedrich Wöhler housing complex to the very end of the exhibition. The third part of the exhibition were the freestanding panels. The materials on them were supposed to shed light on essential points in the work of Bataille. Here, there was too much information that was only in French. I paid too little attention during the planning phase in Paris to make sure enough written materials in German were selected for the freestanding panels. Criticism that was expressed in these regards was totally justified. The first and most important part of the space exhibition were the books by and about Georges Bataille. I tried to have all books in German, English, French, and Turkish available to look through. The exhibition room was too small, so the books were not easily accessible. There was no really seating available, which made it inconvenient to look through the books. The books were there, but their, represent, their presentation was hardly more than symbolic. There was not enough physical space available in order to give mental space for the books. I also think the role played by the respective workers at the exhibition was not sufficiently active. They were the only ones involved in the battle monument was had only a passive role. It was not possible for them to become active involved. Just like in a museum, they only paid attention to what was going around them. One thing I liked about the exhibition as well as the other sections, library, TV story and snack bar were the graffiti the writings and drawings that covered up more and more of the empty spaces on the panels over the course of the exhibition. That form of appropriation is beautiful in the way it greets increasingly dense and takes over. This was not planned or intended. Some of these added content and statements could then be discussed, but there were also formal enrichment. At the same time, it brought greater complexity of content to the Bata monument. The snack bar. I gained considerable experience from my previous monument project and I tried to learn from it. For example, in discussion with the residents in Avignon about the Dulles monument I made, the suggestion was made to have a beverage stand or a place to sit with refreshments outside of the Dulles monument. In planning the Bataille monument, I was thinking from the beginning of having a snack bar but not outside of the monument as a service, but as an equivalent element of the monument, integrated into it. The idea of snack bar is not or not primarily about offering food and drinks, but about offering an opportunity to converse, to meet, to spend time. At the same time, the snack bar was a future anchor for the housing complex and the residents. The snack bar is a door a way into the monument, and simultaneously it's a part of the monument. People often meet at monument, or monuments in cities to have some drinks and to talk. 
I also want that the snack bar exist for and be used by Documenta 11 visitors and as well the residents from the Friedrich Wöhle Siedlung. I assumed that whoever only drank a beer or eat a döner kebab at the snack bar would also use the monument. For me, it was clear that the snack bar would be run by residents of the housing complex. At first, it was very difficult to find someone to run the snack bar because do those who expressed interest were afraid of the financial risk. The conditions were that there were no, there would no be a rental fee for the stand, no water or electricity bills. The operators could keep all the money taken in by the snack bar, but they had no, they had to organize all the food and beverage. And most important, the snack bar had to be open 12 hours a day every day of the week, just like the other elements of the monuments. This scared the potential operators. In the end, of the, I found a solution, as often in this case, in discussion with the residents. The Caban family decided to run the snack bar. The commitment and realism of this family this, uh, uh, played a major role in making the snack bar as a meeting place and a place to converse. The friendliness and availability of the cabin family, mother, father, son, grandmother, uncle and aunt, often stood out. They operated the snack bar with the Turkish and German refreshments absolutely independently. I was happy that they took on this task seriously. Every evening they cleaned up until 11 in the evening and prepared for the next day when they reopened at 10 in the morning. I thought it was nice that at 10 in the evening, when the monument and the snack bar closed, the last guests to leave were usually from the resi residents, from the housing complex. TV studio. The aim of the TV studio was to create TV reports approximately 10 minutes in length from the Friedrich Wöhle housing complex and to broadcast them in the open channel, a citizen TV channel from the city of Kassel. These TV reports would be produced and edited by the young people and other residents and workers on the ground and then transmitted to the open channel. The, the program had to have something to do with George Bataille to report on the housing complex, its resident, a worker or a visitor to the Bantai monument. We did not any report in the city center. All programs were to be local from the housing complex and about the complex and events happening there directly. I was very happy to see the accumulation of the video cassettes and I'm pleased that we were able to broadcast a new cassette every production day. That is one on 72 days, including Saturdays and Sundays. Excluding Saturdays and Sundays. There were some very dense reports, such as those in which the young people took advantage of to talk about themselves, their problems, their critics, their views. And those of regards by Christoph Fiat, Jean Charles Massera, Manuel Joseph, and the, the poets, and Uwe Fleckner, the art historians, and of course Markus Steinweg, the philosopher. But not all of these reports express the same intensity, necessity, and urgency. Too much of the reports were not discussed and assessed sufficiently in advance. Too often we chose the easiest and fastest solution in order to expand the least amount of effort. This does not I only apply to the TV studio. I often not longer had sufficient energy, often the necessary energy was lacking to tackle more difficult subjects. <coughs> Sometimes I was content with the absolute minimum, that is the daily production of a cassette. I think the TV studio, the most sophistical element of the monument in terms of technology and organization was lacking some assistance that would have served as a link between me and the residents who produce the video. Over the time, the TV studio became an active meeting place opening to his central geographic location in the housing complex, the proximity to the residents and the Bata monument workers living there. I recall the evenings with Reinhold, Gudrun and friends sitting in front in the TV studio and discussion. These situations made the TV studio into a pillar of the Bataille monument, open to both visitors and residents alike. So the document 11 visitors mostly sat inside in the TV studio and the residents sat outside in front of the studio. The workshops. The motivation for the workshops was 
I wanted the Bataille Monument to be lasting. That is, I wanted small events radiating out from the Bataille Monument to be held during the exhibition in the Friedrich Wöhler housing complex. Something was created, produced, here and now, that had some relationship to George Bataille. The two debates by Jean-Charles Massere, who worked with the young people to perform text he had written, led in the very beginning to intense discussion. Jean-Charles' understanding, humor, and ambition created the basis for group work that was very important for the continuation, cohesion, and for the seriousness of our project. The ten forged letters, sculpture as a bullfight by Manuel Joseph, and his goal of bringing them to the citizens of Kassel by distributing them throughout the city was concrete. Thanks to the HNA, a daily newspaper, almost 100,000 copies of this letter was placed in mailbox of castle households. My experience with the workshops was divided. The workshops I organized ahead of time, the workshops of Jean Charles, Manuel Joseph, Markus Steinweg were very truly enriching. An output, an evidence of the claim that the Badai monument can produce something. On the other hand, I had imagined it there would be many more workshops, workshops, such a housing complex run, a boxing event, small concerts with the residents, a capoeira dance event, a conversation with the person working for the city of Kassel in charge of Joseph Boy's Documenta 7000 Oaks project. None of these workshops took place. It was too, I, wa, it, I was too busy with all the daily tasks of supervising and maintaining the Batal Monument that there was no energy left over to organize and carry out workshops. I underestimated that without preparation or organizational assistance, there were limits to my energy. The only workshop that took, uh, took place was not planned in advance. It was the alternative anarchist construction trailer that docked into the Batal Monument for a week. Here, too, I was surprised at the tolerance shown by a majority of the residents with respect to the protest action. The workshops by Markus Steinweg, his idea of text output, his understanding of the Batai monument as a machine, as a Batai machine, was very beautiful. It was it was to see the exhibition. It was nice to see the exhibition panel on the ontological cinema that was set up in the library and continued to expand and to realize that a lot of people took copies of Marcus' text with them. This satisfied his goal: philosophy confronts reality immediately and directly. Philosophy acts. Philosophy is necessary. Webcams. I was not pleased with the element webcams. The element that intended to use the internet to create a link to the world, to the non-visitors of the Bataille Monument. Aside from any criticism as regards particular content of internet, what I really like about the internet in, in all unspeakable poorness are the web cameras and the connected illusion of communication of creating a feeling of simultaneity with others. I like that idea, this unreflected and simplest idea of letting someone participate. That is what I wanted to achieve with the web cameras and the website Bataille Monument. But the form is important insofar as it shows everything about the intention, and it was Im impossible for me to work out this form in the direction I wanted. I wanted absolute minimum, pure webcams, pure simultaneous communication or pure simultaneous non-communication. I wanted that it be possible without any text or any legend. I wanted that the only option is for people to be able to quickly have a look into the Bata monument at the same time from Africa, Asia or wherever. This was not possible because the website were designed uniformly by graphic designers, including a biography project description, a couple of photos, etc. The website became an illustration. Even worse, it became information instead of impossible communication through a web camera. I think this was also the reason why I received the least amount of feedback or critics regards this element of the Bataille Monument. Sculpture. The sculpture element in the Bataille Monument was intended to isolate the object <coughs> The exterior, the visible, that which is generally refer referred to as a monument. The sculpture was supposed to be only the sculpture, 
of the monument and not the monument itself. That sculpture is only a part of the monument. It's the skin of a monument. The sculpture is the sculpture. Yet, it is precisely the question that emerged from the misunderstanding and led to discussion about the sculpture. Once it was isolated from the monument, the sculpture took on the function of a meeting place, a playground, or rather a romping ground, as well as a place to sit, use it mostly during the evening hours. Many viewers raised the question as to what statement it was making, what it's intended to represent. There is no way to avoid it even thought it forms developed superficially. Once it was decided from me that the main goal was to create a sculpture to pose the question of the monument, it's no longer mattered what the sculpture looked like. I did not want to copy the human figure as I made at the Spinoza monument or the head as I made for the Dulles monument. The sculpture of wood, plastic, and cardboard covered with packing tape survived in good conditions for the duration of the exhibition only, thank to our own repair team that each day retaped and retouched the places where it was torn or wrapped, scrapped. This repair service was necessary because without the daily repairs, replacing and reinforcing parts of the sculpture as well as other parts of the element of the Batai monument would not through, lasted through the entire exhibition period end. Confrontation. There was considerable degree of discussion about the Batai monument. I was surprised since we calculated that only about 5% of the visitors to Document 11, Platform 5, came to the Friedrich Wöhler's housing complex. I think there was so much discussion since this project was complex, problematic, but as well beautiful. This carried over the temporary visitors and questions invo involved in a way I had never experienced before. I think the circumstances that the Bada Monument was set up as an experience in public space throughout the duration of the exhibition led to this consequences. Also, I do think it was very important to be on the ground in the housing complex the whole time. It was important to be there on the site as a superintendent for the housing complex and for the workers. I wanted to offer a sign that I care about my work and I won't leave the complex not alone with my work. On the other hand, it was necessary to solve all the everyday problems that arose, technical, organizational, and human. I saw it as a noble task. I appreciated this confrontation with the everyday reality of such a project. I was very virtually ever, ever present, over present. Not because I am an approachable artist or a communicator artist, but because I wanted everything to work all the time. An important confrontation through and with my work was the Sue discussion. The Sue criticism is something that has continually arisen also in other projects I made in public space. I'm, the criticism assumes that either the visitors the, to the housing complex find themselves in a zoo or so they feel like zoo tourists. Or the criticism is that the visitors to the monument are brought around as if they were on display. I think it is to note that obviously the question of who feels as if they are in a zoo was not clearly and definitely answered. Who is on display? Who is the tourist? I reject this crew zoo criticism because it is not about responsibility, because it's only a question of oversensitivity and bad conscience. It's a matter of the individual, comfortable, theoretical oversensitivity of a kind of art audience. The Friedrich Wöhler housing complex. I was often asked from visitors how the project was received by the residents of the housing complex. I'm certainly the least person who could answer this question. It seems obvious that an answer would involve a valid judgment. That would mean that if the project was received well, it was a success, and if what not, then it was a failure. The Batai Monument project was not a matter of acceptance or rejection, and it was not about functionality. It was an assertion. This assertion first had to be endured before it is possible to discuss any conclusion to be drawn. The Batai Monument was built as an experience, but the experience has to be made. 
I was confronted with people who li live on outskirts of a mid-sized German city. In many discussions, especially experience the incredible strength of questioning throughout art. In the Friedrich Wöhler housing complex, I perceived the importance of art, of philosophy, of poetry even its necessity as something existential and fundamental. With respect to the Batai monument, I noticed that the tolerance, acceptance, confrontation and exchange grew with each day of the exhibition. One conviction grew stronger in everyday practice in the housing complex. The conviction that art can fight for and assert a space. It is the conviction that art can create a mental space, that it can penetrate into the brain. I was encouraged by this. I paid the workers for their assistance, as I briefly mentioned it at the start. And I did explain why I think it is important. But nevertheless, the issue of payment, the whole money issue remains unresolved for me, also with respect to this project. Of course, for all workers, it was first and foremost a way to earn money with and through the Bata Monument. There is nothing wrong with that. That is reality. But the problem and unresolved issue is that as soon as payment is involved, inevitably, the working hours and achievements of the co-workers are observed. A working relationship develops. The paid labor has the disadvantage, disadvantage that the questioning of giving how much effort, how much work will I invest, is weighted against the question of talking. How much do I earn? How much profit it with it? This led to many unpredicted and non-beautiful situations. I was overwhelmed each Monday with new, when new groups were formed and work was divided up. But I had to accept this egoistical comparison among the participants because I am the responsible. Media response. The media response received what, what, what I considered a surprising amount of attention. It was very media discussion project. I have no complaints about that. We needed it, I needed it. But I was also surprised at the superficial and light white reporting. The Bataille Monument, with all the questioning it raised, was hardly reflected in his problematic and complexity. I noticed it is in the reporting and throughout some discussion with journalists how great the time pressure and sales pressure was with respect to reader friendly writing and topic selection. This is why I also realized that the great media response has nothing to do with the artistic value, of course, of this project. I was well aware that this was a matter of quantity of media presence and not of refined analysis. I did not discover this for the first time regarding this project. Right at the beginning of the project, I decided to accept all requests for interviews and all possible meetings with journalists. Without exception, I plan to answer all questions posed by the media and to provide information about about Iman. I did it deliberately for the project. I did this for the housing complex. I did it for the workers and all the helpers. I assumed that not every visitor's Documenta 11 Platform 5 could come to the Bata Monument because of time constraints. Therefore, I thought it would be important to take advantage of all possible channels of media to, take, to talk about our project. I deliberately attempted to wide the geographical disadvantage and balance it out through media presence. In any case, this media presence was assessed positively in the housing complex, and I cannot imagine how the Habatai monument would have lasted in the Friedrich Wöhler Siedlung if there was no media coverage, no radio or TV report, and no articles on it. Talking down. I also wanted to be present when the project was taken apart. I did not want to leave the residents of the housing complex alone with the job of dismantling the project. What I did not foresee, however, was that it would only take three days to take down. It took three days for all materials and all parts of the pattern monument to be taken down, or rather, turned down. I understood the actual process of dismantling, or better, turning down the project as a ritual. In no time at all, virtually, all usable materials, the plexiglass pans, wooden posts, boards, strings of lights, chairs, lamps, everything that was at all reusable was turned down and put in small storage piles at the building entrances. Everything was then immediately taken inside by the residents and put in the basement or elsewhere. 
It all went so fast that I had the impression it was as prepared in events or it was a ritual in which participation in taking away and transferring the natural's market appropriation or winning back of something. Of course, it could be also assumed that many of the families living in the firm Friedrich Wöhling housing complex were forced by their economic situation to refuse to reuse materials and not to let things go to waste. Nevertheless, I remember these days as moments of a frenetic practice reclaiming according to unspoken rules. Was the reclaiming of material as mean of reclaiming the space that I had been taken up and used and the reclaiming of the housing complex and their values. All of this happened without sadness or aggression. I wanted to leave the space as it was when I arrived, for the sake of the residents, but also for the sake of the Bata Monument, because I think that the memories of the residents, visitors and workers, as well as my memory of the joint experience I had, is an essential, is an essential part of the project, through the notion of monument to the notion of memory. The only thing that we were kept and brought back to the storage or put in the document archives in Castle were the books and the texts and video that were produced in the course of the exhibition. All hi-fi and video equipment tools and vehicles used by the shuttle service were raffled off in a tombola to the participants, so everyone could take something home with them. It was a method of distributing the material without regard to the amount of work or time invested or the earning of the individual workers, but instead as a matter of chance. This tombola was a transition back to the realities of the daily life without nostalgia or sentimentality. I am aware of the importance and strength and the lakes of the Batai monument and the fact that it has set an example, but I'm less sure whatever in order to carry through such a project, this requires an unbalanced and often inconsistent artist, focusing only on his goal, just as myself. Many conflicts, situation in the housing complex could have been resolved more calmly, with more coolness and with less bungling. Thank you. Okay, we have about an hour and 15 minutes for discussion. I'm going to um, invite Magali Ariola, a Patrick Charpenel, and Mutalas to join us. Um, Magali uh, and Patrick have kindly agreed to be respondents on this panel, and uh, they will open the questions uh, today. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I, w I was asked to mention that if everybody could return their their um, translation uh, apparatuses today at lunchtime, because this afternoon it will be in Spanish, the, the discussion, um, because the company is changing this afternoon. So if everybody could, could leave these at lunchtime and not take them with you at lunch. Okay. Okay. Do you want to start? Yeah. Magali? ¿Se oye? Este, bueno, voy a hablar en español porque creo que va a ser un poco más fácil para, digo, para mí, para la dinámica de la, de la mesa. Eh, bueno, gracias a Tobías y a Isa y a Citac por este, pues darme la oportunidad, aunque sea muy breve, de, de tratar de participar en esto. Eh, yo estoy pensando desde ayer que decir hay algo que quizás me preocupa, que es como el protagonismo que está adquiriendo, digamos, esta manta con su tipografía, etcétera, la palabra de resistencia, cuando siento que muchas de las, de las pláticas y de las intervenciones de pronto han, han girado quizás más en torno, me gustaría, me gustaría decir como en torno a la, a la idea de residuos. Eh, decir que la palabra ha aparecido de alguna manera en varias de las ponencias y estoy pensando, bueno, eh, concretamente un poco la ponencia de, de Foster de ayer cuando mencionaba la, la práctica del archivo y eh, ahora eh, con la ponencia de, de, 
de Thomas que o sea, la manera en que recupera digamos la idea de monumento como un monumento temporal un monumento efímero de alguna forma y lo que planteaba Foster ayer de, de digamos el impulso archivístico eh, en cuanto a esta como especie de recuperación o recolección de fragmentos de, de la historia es decir de alguna manera supongo que es como darle la, sacarle la vuelta al eh, como toda esta idea hegemónica eh, ideológica de la historia, así de plantear discursos hegemónicos y ahí supongo que es donde se, se junta un poco con la cuestión de resistencia. Ahora quisiera, lo que quisiera plantear es un poco, digo, creo que incluso lo que se planteó ayer y lo que estaba eh, planteando ahora, este, juntadas también en cuanto a la cuestión de la cooptación a través de los medios masivos de comunicación, todo esto, es decir, realmente como si, si creen que de alguna manera se puede reutilizar, digamos, esta idea como de, de residuo como una forma de resistencia en sí. Y si esto de alguna manera tuviera que ver como una especie, como una especie como de subjetivación, digamos, de la historia o de los contextos sociales, políticos, etc. Y bueno, cuando digo subjetivación no es tanto como recuperación del sujeto, sino más bien, digo, no, digamos, no, el, no una cuestión, una visión subjetiva, eh, identitaria o egocéntrica, sino realmente... Eh, digamos como apelando de alguna forma a la memoria en contra de la historia, es decir, con, con todo lo que esto conlleva de, de formaciones, etcétera, y nuevas lecturas paralelas a los, a los hechos que ya existen. No sé quién quiere comenzar. Tomás. Um, I was just uh, at the beginning um, a little bit worried about the work Resistencia, yeah. because uh, I think it's pretentious to say uh, I'm a resistant or I want to resist, because I think art, a doing art, is a resistential act, and I would like to say as well, commercial art is resistance. So uh, after this, I have just to try. To, to do my work. ¿Quieres comentar, preguntar otra vez? Bueno, yo uh, añadiría que la palabra resistencia, si lo tomamos desde la perspectiva de común, de los más media, nos asociamos más a detergentes y a productos como automóviles, la resistencia de los productos a ser lavados, a el tanto por ciento, la resistencia a los materiales. Lo digo porque extendería la, a la pérdida de sentido las palabras. Cualquier palabra, las palabras ya lo apuntaba antes, ¿no? activismo, resistencia, eh, tienen una interpretación que conocemos, que le damos pero no podemos evitar de que estas uh, uh, interpretaciones salgan de esta definición para llegar a una ampliación de popular que va a otro lado. O sea, yo me imagino que si alguien pasa por delante del teatro insurgente si no sabe exactamente lo que es y ve la palabra resistencia, ¿a qué puede asociarlo? Okay. Um, Patrick. Bueno, este, ya como que se está desviando, yo tenía preparado unas preguntas que versaban sobre el contenido muy puntual de lo que se había expuesto, pero con, a raíz de la pregunta de Magalí, me viene a la mente eh, algo que, sobre el, el clima que se vivió ayer en, en, en aquí en, en CITAC, y me llamó mucho la atención que intentando eh, caer en soluciones absolutas y, y radicales eh, desde distintas perspectivas, finalmente creo que se dieron soluciones absolutas y radicales. Y, eh, y yo creo, pues, volviendo a esta idea del residuo, que sí que deberíamos bien eh, intentar, en todo caso, hacer una suerte de resistencia articulando sentidos y no, como se dijo ayer, presentando algo radicalmente nuevo, que me pareció. Entonces, no sé si, eh, más que una pregunta es un comentario, pero sí, si hay alguno que quisiera comentar esta, esta idea de residuo que, que, 
Bueno, también ha apuntado la presentación que vivimos un mundo bastante generalizado, que las eh, ha pasado un poco la idea de consignas en relación a partidos políticos, a generalizaciones de tipo de vista de casi diría filosóficas y que la vida cotidiana y la vida del individuo hace que nos planteemos la situación y hablaba del caso por caso, de que las situaciones se tienen que analizar una a una. Yo creo que no es un momento de grandes discursos sobre lo que se tiene que hacer, lo que es bueno, lo que es malo para cada uno. Yo creo que estamos en un momento que individualmente tiene que crear su propia manera de elegir y que esas elecciones la hacen la manera de que cada uno se proyecta. Y ahí está en situaciones políticas y en situaciones de tipo eh, cotidianas. Yo creo que el caso a caso, el no, la, no poder generalizar. Yo creo que estamos viviendo a veces situaciones de grandes generalizaciones cuando lo único que se puede hacer es, eh, o sea, cualquiera de nosotros, en que, habrá cosas en que estaremos de acuerdo y hay cosas que no estamos de acuerdo. Lo que no se puede hacer es, es crear que los individuos están automáticamente, sistemáticamente en, de acuerdo en todo. Yo creo que es importante, y desde la práctica artística yo lo creo también, que todas estas contradicciones que podemos tener desde el punto de vista de la producción, de la presentación, en relación a, a lo que pueden ser los sistemas de poder, de mercado, la única manera es analizarlo punto a punto y considerar el, el eh, trabajar en un proyecto, o el contribuir a ese proyecto, o el no, etcétera, según la relación con la situación que se presenta. Thomas, do you want to comment on? Uh, was this a question? No, no. <laughs> no. no. Um, I just can say, um, when I say, for me, to me, art is, uh, is resistance, you know, a physical resistance. Doing art is creating physical resistance. Uh, that's it. I mean, I had a question for, for you, Thomas, in terms of, could you speak a little bit more about the specific uh, community that you worked with? Um, there was a lot of attention made about the fact that it was a primarily Turkish community, and you spoke, you, you spoke about the satellite issue. Would the, I mean, a little bit more about your goals in terms of choosing this specific community, would how would the project have changed in a different context within Kassel? I mean, you, you could have chosen a community closer to the rest of the, of, of the exhibition, and th there was a sort of um, identity-related issue here in terms of the, how the community was seen from the outside, primarily. Yeah. Yes, so um, of course the choice of the space is very important. Uh, I don't know how it, it could work in another location. I know only my experience I made there. But of course, the choice of the location is what I can do as an artist who make a project in a public space. My project was to make a critique of the thinking of the monument and as well to propose another monument. The critique, for example, is to uh, why I critique monuments, because they are made for uh, the eternity. Also, that we don't, we know that's not true. They are never for the eternity, as uh, uh, recent elements, uh, events uh, uh, shows us. So, first time, it's not for the eternity. Secondly, monuments are often in strategical, in cent in central places, in um, historical places. So, I wanted to do my monument not in a place like this, but in a place where people live where people live, where people from castle live because it was in castle. So it's up to me to choose which people I, I would like to confront with my project. Mm -hmm. And after this, of course, I could do it perhaps more in the city center or perhaps in, a, in another location. Uh -huh.
Anthony Montada, este, eh, aunque no aparece, aunque no apareció en, en su ponencia, en la presentación aquí de, del programa, eh, habla usted de una figura que me llamó mucha atención, que me gustaría ver si pudiera abundar más sobre ella, que es la del asesor. Y sobre todo, y la pregunta de si hay una, se puede, el asesor, el curador en cierta medida no se ha convertido en una clase de, en un tipo de, de asesor, porque en el modelo neoliberal, como aparece ahí planteado, eh, el asesor se ha, figurado, se ha convertido como en el, en el responsable de conducir los discursos. Eh, <coughs> Desde el año 1984 empecé a desarrollar un trabajo que se llama Political Advertisements. Es la recopilación de la propaganda política en Estados Unidos. Desde Eisenhower hasta el año que, en el 84 que acababa con Reagan. Cada cuatro años este trabajo se revisa y se presenta una semana antes de las elecciones. Fue el 88, 92, 96, 2000 y estamos preparando el 2004. Eh, viendo este trabajo sobre la publicidad política que en el fondo presenta a los candidatos como pueden ser objetos y productos de consumo, empezó a aparecer un personaje que es el advisor político, la persona que cambia la cosmética del, físicamente del del candidato, pero también el discurso y la manera en que eh, el, todo, si hay unos planteamientos políticos, se reconstruyen en forma de eh, ser eh, vendible. A partir de, de, esta, de esta evidencia, me pareció interesante ver que estos personajes que, que no se ven, que tienen una ciertas responsabilidades y que en el fondo influyen, hay, eh, son, es importante ponerlos en, en evidencia. Estamos, estoy en colaboración con Marcel Ruiz haciendo un trabajo sobre estos personajes, sobre un, una película que se llama Democracy TM, de que cómo las transformaciones de políticas eh, y los candidatos pueden ser transformados y que estos eh, advisors pueden funcionar tanto en Estados Unidos como en Brasil, como eh, Israel, como en Sudáfrica. Son eh, prácticamente eh, eh, especialistas en marketing y en, eh, en lanzamientos de productos. Eh, pensé que en un momento dado que el rol del... del um, del curator como una cierta analogía, no estoy seguro. Yo creo que estas notas son más, lo he dicho antes, pensando en voz alta y eran cuestiones abiertas, de que los roles de, que se establecen entre el arte y el artista y la audiencia, también fue un trabajo que investigué durante 10 años, Between the Frames, han sido, eh, han tomado unas en muchos casos un cierto protagonismo y una cierta uh, acumulación de poder. Y vemos que en estos roles que existen, uh, podemos llamar galerías, podemos llamar uh, críticos, podemos llamar uh, uh, coleccionistas, todos los, los roles entre la producción y la presentación han, eh, han tomado a partir de los 80 sobre todo un gran protagonismo en fin, tampoco es descubrir nada eh, en, en esta situación yo creo que la idea del eh, curator independiente ha tomado también un rol y una situación que hacía una, una analogía por una situación de que eh, la falta quizás de, de commitment en muchos casos, y claro, no, lo he dicho antes, no es una cuestión de generalizar, eh, me, me refiero punto a punto, pero que se vuelve una situación de, este, de, una, de una cierta eh, eh, relación con el espectáculo de la cultura y que forman parte de una manera... Eh, de tomar una cosa y dejarla en un momento dado y la falta de commitment eh, quizás al proyecto. Entonces, esta es un poco la analogía que podía haber y que realmente tiene que ver con elementos de tipo, por un lado, comerciales o de negocios y desde el punto de vista también de, 
de la, de la referencia de la cultura. Okay. Okay. Vamos a abrir este por preguntas del, del público. Hay micrófonos también, sí. Okay. Preguntas, respuestas. Oh, Eri. Sí. Sí, Eri. Uh, yo quisiera dirigirme a los uh, dos uh, ponentes. Primero para agradecerlos y luego preguntar algo que está repitiéndose cada vez más en el debate, que es el cuestionamiento de la palabra resistencia. Y creo que concuerdo con la respuesta de Tomás cuando dice el producir el arte es un acto de resistencia y además el producto es Uh, una resistencia en sí misma. Pero ayer, uh, relacionándolo con uh, ayer, uh, primero hablamos uh, del olvido, hablamos uh, de la memoria y hablamos también de una cierta amnesia. Yo creo que al lado de la amnesia deberíamos colocar también la anestesia. Porque en un momento dado, creo que todos los artistas se están dando cuenta cada vez más que el protagonismo que está señalando Anthony Muntadas de muchos que están en este engranaje de legitimación, distribución o circulación de la obra de arte, están teniendo cada vez decisiones mucho más importantes que las que puede tener el artista y condiciona aquello, tanto la percepción el consumo y la propagación de una idea de arte que si sigue creciendo como tal va a tener mucho más lugar que lo que tal vez pudiera ser totalmente diferente y conservarse como una acción artística. En el caso, por ejemplo, de los dos, me ha tocado vivir experiencias directas con sus obras. En el Monumento a Batay estuve tres días en el monumento viviendo con los turcos, preguntando, checando, y realmente la apropiación que ellos hicieron del monumento rebasa lo que Tomás ha dicho aquí. O sea, era suya, era su obra, y eso escapaba a la dimensión de documenta. Pero dentro de todos los recortes de prensa de documenta jamás se habla de eso. Entonces, esa vulnerabilidad que se manifiesta cuando hay una voluntad genuina de participar, de involucrar, de despertar, ¿Por qué en un momento dado se merma ante esa superpotencia amorfa que llamamos mercado o que llamamos simplemente poder que puede llegar a desestabilizar o a, a quitarle sustancia lo que es un producto activo que puede despertar conciencia? Entonces, en ese sentido, ¿qué respuestas puedan tener artistas críticos, curadores o activistas para en un momento dado decirle a esa potencia invasora, ok, hemos siempre convivido juntos, pero quédate aquí, no pases este límite, porque de pasarlo vas a adulterar lo que yo estoy haciendo y no me conviene ni estoy dispuesto a esto. ¿Cómo ustedes ven esa situación? Bueno, me refiero otra vez al caso por caso. No podemos generalizar. Ahora, es evidente que, que haya un museo, que haya curators, que haya un coleccionismo, históricamente tiene su razón de ser. Creo que es necesario que exista. Es todo un sistema que es necesario porque es un soporte para la producción del arte y, la, y, y su visibilidad. El punto sería que como muchas de estas cosas toman una super eh, responsabilidad en el sentido de acumulación de poder. Es esto lo que me referiría, la acumulación de poder para roles que lógicamente tiene que existir y es necesario que existan y que desborda muchas veces la, la relación de... Pero vaya, yo creo que no, tampoco es una situación que tendríamos que insistir más en eso, no sé. Yo creo que ha quedado ya bastante definido, ¿no? Un 
I try to to do my work of art politically. I do not make political art. The problem of <coughs> resistencia it it gives it's not a question, it's the answer, but I suppose to a political question, but the, the question is not posed. So this is my, when you want, my problem. But as an artist, when I say I would like to work politically, that means to be responsible of every question, of every question who is uh, concerning, who is in relation with my work. Also, the question that I don't have an answer, I have to give an answer. That's what I'm, I think is uh, working politically. Other questions, comments? Oh, go ahead. Yo creo que una de las paradojas de, del arte, del medio del arte, es que eh, si, sobre todo el arte político, del arte de resistencia, es que si bien eh, la propuesta, el contenido de muchas de estas piezas contiene ese, ese intento por, por subvertir o, o alejarse de, del discurso hegemónico, eh, también... Curiosamente, los objetos que gozan de un estatus en el mercado superior son las obras de arte. El objeto valioso por excelencia, además de las joyas, y son las obras de arte. Entonces es muy difícil resistir la tentación de ser incorporado, por eso todo está a la venta, la estadía de todo está a la venta, de ser incorporado, subsumido por el mercado o el capitalismo. Okay, once again, I try with my very basic English to say, uh, or just my opinion, that uh, asking about commercial art, asking about galleries, about uh, money, who is made by art, is too far away. It's, uh, it's the question about art and what makes us uh, making art. Why I, 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 I do my work of art? What is my, the, from where the energy comes? Uh, what is my uh, proposal I do? This is for me as an artist a question. Yo diría que, que es evidente que todos estamos envueltos en el mercado, en mayor o menor situación. Sería ingenuo pensar de que no. Evidente que hay gente que trabaja con una producción que ya no hablo de dificultad porque todo he recuperado, esto estoy de acuerdo. En los 70 los trabajos que se hacían, trabajos efímeros, trabajos que podría pensarse arte pobre, que no podría ser, está todo en el mercado. Pero yo creo que también hay una cierta independencia por cierta gente que no depende necesariamente del mercado. Yo creo que es muy importante crearse una estructura que la relación que hay es una relación tangencial y que no es una relación directa, que hay elementos en que se participa porque a la larga tiene una cierta participación, pero hay que crear una independencia que esta independencia la puede dar una situación de tipo pedagógica, una situación de tipo de, de proyecto en que no necesariamente todo define la relación económica con el producto del mercado. Quizá, no sé. Pienso de pronto que un poco lo que, te, lo que planteaste muy al principio, Eric, quizás sea menos una cuestión en realidad de mercado que de, ahorita creo que tú lo dijiste, Patrick, como de, de realmente, o sea, en determinado momento lo que se puede plantear es una necesidad de resistir otra vez más bien con una especie de hegemonía de los discursos. Es decir, que no se vuelva este discurso, a mí lo que me preocuparía en lo particular es que no se volviera el, el discurso de resistencia un lugar común, porque eso creo que es lo que es, es muy grave. Es decir, y sí, entiendo perfecto la... la posición de Tomás, es decir, creo que digamos, no es una cuestión, es decir, son dos fenómenos, por supuesto, muy vinculados, la cuestión del mercado, la cuestión de los circuitos artísticos, etcétera, 
pero creo que sí hay dos maneras muy distintas de, de proceder que no están peleadas, pero lo que sí me preocuparía y creo que fue digo, un poco el sabor de boca que me quedó de ayer, eh, por ejemplo, esta cuestión de la estética relacional. Es decir, si hay muchos puntos que de pronto son muy interesantes, creo, digo, y a lo mejor hay posibilidades de hablar, de tocar el tema mañana otra vez cuando se toque el, el, el tema específico de México, pero creo que, por ejemplo, ese ha sido uno de los problemas que hemos vivido nosotros de rebote aquí. Es decir, como de pronto todo se vuelve... Hubo una especie de, de, digamos, predominancia de este discurso de estética relacional en, a nivel de los circuitos artísticos y efectivamente de pronto yo sentí, digo, muy particularmente en México, por ejemplo, que eh, muchas de, las, de los artistas y de las obras se volcaban a repetir ese tipo de modelos que, bueno, otra vez en este contexto me parece un poco problemático y igual es un, un tema que se puede tocar mañana. Ok, uh, más preguntas. Uh, sí, eh, bueno, en lo, en lo particular, eh, no, aquí estoy. Okay. <risa> no comparto la idea que se ha expresado sobre el arte como una misión de, eh, de resistencia. De mi pregunta sería, ¿no se está más bien ahí reproduciendo este, esta fantasía o esta visión de los 60, 70 de atribuirle una misión escatológica al arte, del arte con una misión revolucionaria y con, con sentido al, 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 a la palabra resistencia, que es una palabra que implica un concepto que viene de la física, ¿no? los cuerpos que eh, imponen una, un, una fuerza de, pues de resistencia, de, de, de no, eh, bueno, no tengo ahorita la palabra, pero, pero eh, al, lo que quería señalar era que si no se está más bien ahí eh, reproduciendo este esquema de atribuirle una misión al, al arte, y creo que la, 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 la finalidad más bien del arte es la producción de ciertos objetos, de ciertas sensaciones y, y ya el artista le dará la, la finalidad, pero, pero sí recalcar esta cuestión ideológica, ¿no? teológica que, que está detrás, o sea, no estamos reproduciendo más bien las sombras que, que se criticaron en su momento. I am not sure did I understand uh, uh, everything. Um, I, I can just say, that's interesting me, that you say the, the resistance is a physical phenomenon. I'm, that's my starting point of resistance. This is the starting point who do, does interest me, because uh, I tried to say before, uh, the question of politics is not, not my starting point. So this gives a response perhaps to, to your question. For me, art is a tool. Art is a tool to me to, to be in the world. Art is as well a tool to me to confront with the reality, and I'm not Uh, I'm not afraid to confront, uh, confront contradictions. For example, I'm not afraid to confront the market. I think this is a part of the reality today. Um, and for me, uh, art is as well a tool to live in the time where we are living. So for me, uh, uh, when you say uh, um, it's about shadows or it's about old uh, models, I don't care about. I, I really don't care about. I, I want to act now and, and here. And I mean, uh, the question for an artist, you cannot, um, you cannot Uh, resolve it with a theoretical, or, or begin with a theoretical, um, uh, with a theoretical thing. It's nothing theoretical. It's a practice. Uh, I'm not afraid to producing objects. I'm not afraid. Why I should be afraid producing objects? Who said it to me? I mean, I'm not. As well as an artist, I'm not uh, responsible uh, to comment what others say about my work and my artist practice. I do my work and I can uh, try to give answers to my practice, yes. So I would just like uh, to ask you, please ask me a question in relation uh, directly to my work. Thank you. 
I have a very direct question in relation to Hirschhorn's work, and it has to do with the question of, of what is the stance your monument has in relation to Bataille. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's really a friendly question. I'm not making a, a criticism, mm -hmm. but on the one, I'm trying to, to say this because it might sound like a criticism. It's a, it's, a, it's a real question. How do you feel the, the act of creating this monument stands to the character of Bataille's work? Because this is a work that was transgressive, problematic, in a certain way anti-communitarian, that involved secret elements. I'm just trying to think on, do you think that there's a moment of um, correct transmission of Bataille's project into your audience and your participants? Do you think the monument in a certain way makes justice to, to Bataille? What is the task of the monument in relation to somebody or something like Bataille? Um, it, how can Bataille be addressed uh, in the in the case of a monument. So, uh, of course, I'm not afraid about criticism. Uh, uh, for me, the choice of uh, Georges Bataille is a commitment to him. I tried to explain it before. So it's a commitment. It's love because I love him. I love him for his text, the notion of expenditure, who I think is very important, who helps me, who helps me in a personal as a personal person. So I wanted to dedicate him a monument. Uh, I didn't say, uh, I, it's not a context work, I didn't say uh, the people of the uh, working house complex Friedrich Wieler Siedlung need Georges Bataille. I never said, uh, I never encourage people read Georges Bataille. Why? Why? But I say, I do a commitment, a physical, a artistical, uh, a sculptural commitment to these people, with, uh, to, to Georges Bataille, with these people, and I want to point out that uh, for me, it's a fan commitment. I am a fan of Georges Bataille. It means uh, being a fan, including other ideas of being fan, fan from a football, football club, fan from uh, a, uh, uh, um, a fan from a, um, a, a songwriter, fan from a, a, a pop star. So I, I try uh, not to bring over the ideas uh, from Georges Bataille concrete in, in the neighborhood. I wanted to confront it with my idea and I wanted that uh, they perhaps asking why he chose George Bataille. So of course they was after a transmission. I think the transmission was completely not correct. And I don't want to be correct in this way. But what you only, uh, what I only can give is my op absolutely commitment to George Bataille and to his text. And uh, there was sometimes some, uh, some relation, of course, uh, with uh, this difficult and paradox and complicated and perhaps discutable project I made, the George Bataille uh, mon monument, in regards to the writing of Georges Bataille. But it was not the starting point of, uh, of my project. For me, it's important that these four philosophers I chose, Spinoza, Deleuze, Bataille, and Gramsci, I, I am a fan of them. There will be no other philosopher I will dedicate a monument for them. I have, and this is as well what I can do as an artist, take the responsibility, my own. I have not to, uh, I have not to explain in, in a way why Georges Bataille. That's what I can do. That's what I call uh, making a commitment. Okay, there's a question here down in. Uh, there's one above, and then here, yeah. Acá, a la izquierda, para acá. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. Eh, esto es en realidad para el señor Montada. Eh, tiene, por supuesto, que ver con también la ponencia que nos dio vía telefónica muy amablemente el señor Gustav Metzger. Eh, ambos tienen una postura muy definida en cuanto a lo que plantearon en un comienzo con lo que se les pidió que fue hablar sobre resistencia que, 
Y ambos tienen un común denominador que es muy importante y que inclusive son las imágenes que mostraron, que son lo que son los medios, los medios de común, masivos de comunicación, lo que es el advertisement, lo que podría ser los espectaculares, revistas, slogans, etc. Me queda muy claro, señor Montadas, que usted se está refiriendo a que todo se puede vender. Y también me queda clara un poco, bueno, relativamente la postura del señor Metzger cuando después solicita un código ético para el arte. Pero eh, yo lo que sí que preguntar es, ¿en qué punto los medios de comunicación o este tipo de publicidad que es lo que se le alimenta a todos los pobladores del mundo todos los días, porque todo se vende?, ¿En qué punto estos medios de comunicación realmente están funcionando como una resistencia que originalmente fueron creados para eso? ¿O en realidad uno debería de resistirse a ellos? ¿Y por qué? O sea, en realidad sí, todo se vende, no podemos resistirnos a eso, también le queda muy claro al señor Montadas por lo que nos explicó, y no hay manera de resistirnos, es ingenuo, como usted citó, es un problema sin solución. Entonces, yo como medio de comunicación pregunto, ¿yo me debería de resistir a los medios o en realidad yo debería de ser un medio que ofrezca resistencia ante posturas ingenuas que, que evidentemente no funcionan en este mundo? Y que, bueno, de entrada, y ahí estoy de acuerdo con el señor Hishorn, la palabra resistencia definitivamente es pretenciosa, pero... Si podemos o no resistirnos como medios o como personas que se alimentan de los medios todos los días, nos resistimos al medio, nos vamos a la cueva eh, o doblamos las manos y definitivamente olvidamos el término resistencia o nos vamos hacia lo físico. Resistencia es aguantemos lo que vivimos. Bueno, he planteado varias veces que la respuesta tiene que ser una, una respuesta individual. Yo creo que en este caso eres tú el que tienes que contestar la respuesta de cómo quieres confrontar la situación. Yo diría que, y me refería también antes, a la transformación de las cosas. La publicidad empieza como simple información. Era informar a los de productos que se estaban elaborando e ir decir que eso estaba al abasto y cuál era la mejor calidad. La manera como la información de los productos ha pasado a la publicidad se ha transformado en una situación en que no es una información de los productos, sino es de cómo se venden. Está claro que el rol al principio tenía un sentido, informar a un consumidor. En estos momentos no se informar a un consumidor, es seducir al consumidor para que lo compre. Ha habido una transformación del rol. Como eso, muchas cosas que decía antes, ¿no? que hay una transformación de roles que existen, que son necesarios y que son importantes que existan, pero que se transforman en otras cosas por una situación totalmente en relación con una economía de mercado. O sea, quiero decir, son para, o sea, es paralelos en diferentes sectores de la vida que, que estamos viviendo, ¿no? La manera de confrontar a eso yo creo que es un parte de un paisaje, es un paisaje que nos ha tocado vivir. Ya no podemos decir que en estos momentos, o sea, es realidad, es una realidad y es la manera como confrontamos esta realidad. Yo creo que la respuesta es una re respuesta individual de cada uno. Evidentemente, cada uno esta respuesta la hace con lo que hace. Desde el punto de vista artístico, pues es con el trabajo. Yo creo que, que en este paisaje la gente reacciona a este paisaje y toma una serie de, de en el caso de los artistas, pues son proyectos en que reaccionan a eso. Como dar respuestas posiblemente no, pero levantar preguntas es lo que puede contribuir a esta problemática. Ayer... Eh, Giuseppe Patella decía lo del grano de arena. Yo creo que suena un poco ingenuo, pero yo creo que es la contribución individual que puede hacerse a las cosas. No hay que tomar las cosas, esperar que se solucione de una manera global. I mean, I, I would just have some questions a little bit for you in terms of. I mean, it sounds like you're, I mean, you're speaking about every case is, is a specific case. And I'm sort of interested in, we're talking about sort of strategies and, you know, how you approach um, 
the pro I would ask how you approach the specific projects you're given. I mean, the project we have here is this this conference, and, and how how you would approach this. I see in what you present today a juxtaposition and a sort of representation or re-representation of material that's already out there. Is that something that you see as a viable strategy for like changing that in some way or exposing that? Does that what, what do you hope to generate out of that? The, <clears throat> the reaction is the work. Uh, I was not talking about my works. I think these projects then when I have something interests me, I address a project. I, I think you mentioned two or three projects that I do in the past. The project about cultural censorship, it was the result, the file room. I was confronting a problem of censorship in an instance to create a polemic of that. I decided to create a project that since 94 is still alive in, in, the, in the net. Uh, that the response it should be with the work, mm -hmm. it should be with the work. Uh, that the, <coughs> I've been for many years confronting the idea of mass media and media landscape, but it's on defined on projects. I don't go to start to define now all these projects. Mm -hmm. But if I need to answer you, is like the projects that artists do is the response to the curiosity to try to know more. To try to have an, and of course, when you know more, you become critical. Mm -hmm. If you start to know more than other people or than what you know before, you start to have a position. And I think then that's, I think is, uh, in my case, when I start a project, is by the curiosity to know more and to have information than after I could be taking a position. Mm -hmm. I think these points are also out uh, an important thing that uh, uh, um, we discuss about resistance because an artwork is never, I think, uh, a reaction. It is action. It is um, it's the beginning. It is uh, uh, the first thing. So it has to be, I believe. So and the reaction is coming after. So you cannot say... Uh, um, I, I resist with my work. For me, it's not possible because the resistance is in, in the work. It's in the work. So um, this I would like just to give to, to think. I, I think like this. I think I hope in my work. Also when it is sold. Also when it is sold to, to a fascist. Who I don't know. I think inside the work, work of art is a resistance. This is the question. I mean, we have all these questions as artists always, but this is the question of control, you know? And this question I'm not interested in. I'm really interested in a question of doing, acting, uh, creating. And uh, this, is, uh, um, you, this is never a reaction. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it's, uh, it depends how you position the words. I think, in a, in a way, the word reaction or, re, or respond, I think it could be interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. I think uh, my position is if I am interested in something, I respond to that situation with a work. And I think it's done, I think most of the artists will agree on that. I think it's like a, you do what interests you and what you are concerned and how you want to respond to that. Uh, that um, I'm not interested to analyze the significance of a word because I think the words that are so deteriorated, they are so overused, that I think they will never agree in most of the words. I mean, it's a problem of translation. That's the reason since 95 I've been working in our series, already is eight years, than explore translation, not only word to word or language to language, it's about cultural translation. I think what he's been saying in one context is been maybe understand in other contexts totally different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is the question. Yeah. 
Eh, bueno, mi pregunta es para Tomás y eh, bueno, creo que nos ha dejado muy claro que la, la parte más importante de su proyecto era esa resistencia dentro del trabajo, como trabajar con la comunidad y al parecer el proyecto que nos presentó hoy fue muy exitoso en ese sentido. Pero yo creo que hay que tener muy claro que ese proyecto, que a ese nivel, digamos, básico de su idea es muy exitoso y muy, muy enriquecedor, sobre todo para nivel personal, no deja de insertarse en el marco de la documenta y que lo que dentro de ese nivel de este social funciona de una manera es leído de otra manera por el mundo del arte. Entonces se maneja como la producción artística contemporánea tiene como una fijación o, o es como un, un... Es característica de la producción artística contemporánea ese trabajo social, esa relevancia social del arte, esa inserción del, del arte en un espacio público. Entonces lo que a un nivel funciona como algo muy enriquecedor es manejado como una cosa discursiva que es un poco el problema que aludió Magali Arriola hace rato. Entonces, no, yo creo que no es posible desresponsabilizarse de la lectura que va a tener un, trabajo, un proyecto de esta naturaleza a un nivel de crítica de arte, de institución del arte. Entonces, pareciera que este, de la misma manera en que un cuadro en el siglo XIX en Francia tenía que cumplir con una serie de requisitos para entrar en un salón, de la misma manera este, esta, este trabajo con la comunidad se puede volver un requisito de un de proyectos y que lleguen a lugares como la documenta, digo que más institucional no puede ser, ¿no? Entonces, este, yo creo que las críticas a las que aludió en su ponencia acerca del zoológico se refieren un poco a este punto, ¿no? ¿Qué tanto estamos, este, y bueno, y si, si no había ningún, si el compromiso era más con Batal y una cosa personal, ¿qué necesidad hay de trabajar con la comunidad? Y sobre todo sabiendo que ese trabajo con la comunidad es lo que hace relevante su proyecto desde, desde la perspectiva de la crítica y de los curadores, y eso es lo que lo tiene en esta mesa, por ejemplo. ¿no? Entonces, no sé qué, si, bueno, también me gustaría que si pueda ahondar en, este, en esa parte que se le criticó del zoológico que un poco es también el punto que yo le estaría señalando, a ver si nos puede decir algo. Ok, for me, um, to be clear, the criticism of the zoo comes always, I have to say, from the left-winged public who is searching good conscience. It's about good conscience, you know? But my work is not about good or bad conscience. It's an affirmation, an artistic affirmation, uh, uh, a complex thing that don't want, I'm, I'm not agree with you that it was a success or a big success. There was beautiful moments. It was a strong experience that you can as well say it is uh, uh, very criticable and uh, it is uh, contradictory. So for me uh, to work with the people, again I try to say this project was too big to do it myself, but every artist make big projects and he need help. So, but of course the help in the museum are the assistants, or when he is an artist invited in an art school, he do the work, a big work with the art students in the school. So I did just it with the people on the spot, on the ground. So, because I decided to do my monument there, because I want not, I wanted not do my monument in a strategical or central place or in a Park, for example, from Castle. So it is just logical that, uh, that I ask the people to help to me and to say always to the people who works with me, this is an art project and it's not a social project, helps a lot. Even when I agree, it's not completely clear, perhaps, this line. And often I had problems myself to hold the line between what is an artist and what is a social work. For example, when people say to me, please, Thomas, uh, put uh, books uh, from children's in the library, I say, no, why? There is no relation to George Bataille. So people perhaps was disappointed, but in another way they understood. They understood it. You know, it's about this. Or uh, when somebody uh, didn't work very well, but he was living there, I didn't say you don't work well or something like this. It's not about or when somebody didn't um, didn't come to work or something. It isn't 
there is no social, there is no social issue, and there is, uh, it's just about making an art work and be coherent as an artist, because I make it there, so it's, I, I, I propose to the people I want to do it with you, so I cannot after say, yeah, but you are a thief, or you stole me this, so you cannot work with me, and this is what art can do, you know, but so, Social work cannot do this, social work can do other things, but art can do this, and that's what I was interested in this project. Más preguntas. Hay una arriba también. Sí, son dos preguntas. Sí, el, el, la primera es, si todo queda limitado entonces a la respuesta del, del sujeto, del artista, y, y entonces, ¿cómo podríamos explicar bueno, el, 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 las tendencias colectivas, el propio proyecto de TV eh, Bataille y el que estemos aquí reunidos y, y incluso el propio proceso de la, de la globalización y de las altas eh, tecnologías que están ahorita imperando que obedecen a lógicas eh, comunitarias, dinámicas comunitarias? Y la segunda sería, con, con refer, referencia al término resistencia, ¿por qué resistencia y no rebeldía? O sea, no está detrás de, de la resistencia, más bien la cuestión, la resistencia no es más bien, no, no tiene una tendencia a lo reaccionario y eh, a la regresión, y no más bien sería una cuestión de rebeldía, de subversión, de sublevación. As an artist, I, I, as well, I would like to respond to the question came before from this question. I understand this question. You ask me, for example, should I resist to mass media or so? I don't know, but I don't resist to mass media. I mean, I, uh, why I should I work with the mass media? Because I think the mass media is a part of the reality. And uh, with a lot of questions uh, concern the reality today, I, I'm not going out or not working with the idea I resist to this, I resist to, I want discover, I want discover, I want to know better, and I want that I can say, and that's perhaps what you say, yes, I would confront me, I would, with this, I, was, I would like to confront me with this. The problem is, I, th I think in the word, resistencia that it is in one way but I'm I'm not sure is artwork in one way you know I don't know in which direction it goes but uh, I know it is perhaps and that's I I like what you say it's perhaps about something rebel it's perhaps about something only you think it has to be like this and of course you give yourself the tools to express this I don't know. I think perhaps inside this is something you can you because you can call this resistance, and that's that's uh, that's okay. Más preguntas aquí? Yeah. Or primero aquí y después. I want to address um, uh, Thomas. Um, uh, I, I find that the way you speak about the process of your work and and the way you work and everything, to me it sounds like if you are living in an ivory tower up above reality, and then you descend to reality and find reality, and I find that very naive. And also, from my point of view, very, um, uh, I see it like, like if you are like a spoiled person living outside reality and having to go down reality and confront it and finding stuff and, and I think it's very, to my point of view, very ridiculous. What do you think about that? I, I mean, I have no problem with your criticism. Yeah. But I, I guess I would ask the question if, I mean, you are interested in having the project reflect reality and, and, and what Reality as compared to what? I mean, in, in, in terms of, you seem to be setting it up in relationship to the art world, you know, in, in, in the context of documenta. I mean, or, I mean, or how, do you, how do you respond to the question of reality compared to what we experience every day? I mean, what's the, you know, I mean, how, how do you, how are you 
or have not a definite reality, as he he think I'm living in a, in a in a tower or something like this. I mean, um, this is uh, this is something I have not to explain. What is my reality? Are they people here? They think I'm not living in the reality like you live, like we live all in the reality. Wait, there, there is one question over here. Um, no es pregunta, es más bien un comentario o probablemente dos. Pues en torno al término de resistencia, como estaban diciendo, no, yo no lo veo bueno, o a lo mejor sí, eh, relacionarlo con rebeldía, el por qué resistencia como título del, del simposio y, 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 y darle todo esto, todo este giro y estar así como que sintiendo que es el, 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 el problema o el dogma a, a categorizar, a, a, a asimilar, a, a unirnos a esta resistencia, a ser todos resistentes o no. Y, este, y, y la verdad, o sea, como que creo que la cosa es más simple, ¿no? O sea, hay resistencia en, o sea, hay cotidiana en todas las cosas, o sea, el, el, el acto de nacer es una especie de resistencia, el tráfico es una resistencia, o sea, hay muchas cosas en la vida diaria, o sea, resistencia, como decía un amigo atrás, o sea, se refiere mucho a fuerzas físicas, o sea, resistencia, o sea, está dentro de las leyes de gravedad, la, la, la misma, el girar de la tierra es, es una especie de resistencia, entonces así como que venir a decir resistencia, tenemos que unirnos y... y, y, y formar este, este batallón o este ejército, así como que de repente lo veo así un poco pretencioso, ¿no? Y, y, o sea, y en términos de semántica, o sea, resistencia, lo estamos comparando así en contra, de, o sea, a, opuesto a una cuestión como, como oposición o sometimiento, o sea, vamos a, pon, a, a contraponernos a un sometimiento, a una, a, a una especie de esto, ¿no? Y resistencia, pues es una especie más de, de estrategia es o sea es como 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 decir eh, no es lo mismo o sea resign que giving up o sea en ese sentido o sea veo resistencia I'm, como una especie de estrategia yo me puedo retirar de una de una lucha y no necesariamente eso quiere decir que haya perdido la misma la misma batalla la misma lucha entonces o sea ese tipo de, 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 de girar en torno a una especie más de, 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 de oposición nosotros mismos y, 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 y cuando nosotros mismos a lo mejor también o sea hacemos una especie de, de sometimiento los que somos artistas plásticos sometemos al, al, al material sometemos un lienzo en blanco sometemos al, 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 o sea, a las pinturas a, al, 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 okay. a la madera o sea Sí, hay, especies... una, ¿Hay una pregunta por or, también? No, no okay. aclaré que era no, comentario. comentario. Okay. Okay, está bien. ok, no hay mucho tiempo más, entonces yo quiero tomar dos preguntas más. E Eri y Aya. Okay. Sí. Yo la pregunta que quisiera hacer a uno de los, a los que intervinieron, ¿la Torre de Marfil no es realidad? Ya, yeah. yo creo que nos estamos enfrascando en una literalidad de términos que si hemos abierto la discusión en torno a la resistencia es simplemente reflexionar en torno a su aspecto metafórico creativo, o sea, ¿qué es la resistencia en mano de alguien? Sea el campesino, el artista o quien sea. Si cada uno sale de aquí dándose una respuesta Creo que estamos articulando algo que pudiera por lo menos despejar dudas a muchos, pero no estamos aquí buscando conclusiones ni cerrando ni agotando el tema. Y si lo que, por ejemplo, dijeron del caso de la obra de Thomas, uh, yo me acuerdo aquí haber hecho algo uh, en 1993 con los tepiteños, que es la exposición de Tepito, Uh, mito mágico al burro del tiempo en el Museo de Culturas Populares y la verdad la gran satisfacción no estaba en una torre de marfil de ver a las dos de la mañana una fila de caravanas, de camiones de mudanza de los tepiteños diciéndome, Eri, no compres ningún mueble, traemos nuestra casa y lo instalamos en el Museo de Culturas Populares 
y se apropiaron del museo durante toda la exposición y para mí eso era reivindicar de que culturas populares no tenía tal vez lugar en Coyoacán, había que desplazarlo de ese lugar para otro, para que los coyoacanenses no se quejen de que por qué traigo la muchedumbre, la chusma de Tepito al Museo de Culturas Populares. Entonces creo que cuando hablamos de la Torre de Marfil, tenemos que revisar muy bien de que es parte de la naturaleza, parte de la realidad, porque esa realidad nunca la vamos a poder significar con un icono. Gracias. Okay. Okay, I, I'm sorry I'm being told we have to um, stop for lunch now, but I hope the discussion will continue in the afternoon as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mutales, Tomas. Thank you. Mm -hmm.